for the Fed right now, uh, it actually might be easier for them to continue to attack or at least try to bring under control this inflation issue. The Fed is open-minded, as the Fed always is. We are at an important inflection point in the inflation story. If you look at the 25% decline early in the year, I think that was the baking end of a mild recession. You know, the economy is not out of the woods. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrow, Lisa Bramitz, and Tom Keene. In historic Wednesday, a statement on inflation in America. Kaylee Lines in for John Farrow. I talked to Farrow yesterday, stuck in Rome off the Italo train from Naples. He's trying to get back home. He's coming out of FCO, Lisa, and it looks to be a struggle. Lisa, let's get right to it on inflation. Your observation as we go to 8.30 this morning. It's going to be about the headline CPI number. It's going to be about the core CPI number. And then it's going to be the read through to the real economy, real wages, which we also get at 8.30 a.m. How negative do they go? They are currently the most negative in data going back to 2007, which is what we're hearing about on the margins with disposable <clears throat> income evaporating. I agree with you. Real wages underplayed here and very, very important as well. I like what Alan Ruskin says at Deutsche Bank. We're going to give you some of the research done here in the last 12 hours. Again, that's what surveillance does. And he has with Deutsche Bank December CPI above above 4%. Lisa, the most important chart I saw, thank you, Zero Hedge, for bringing it to my attention, with Bank of America with four glide paths. We have inflation, Lisa, back nicely into the second quarter, 2023. This is the issue, and you've raised this many times, Tom, and it's your right to do so. At what point does the Fed signal we're done or we can start moving away? How far down do we get? And then you've uh, talked about how do we get from 4% to 3%? It's a big leap. Right now we're looking at a broadening out of some of the inflation inputs and where people see it going. That's right. why we're watching Fed speak today and going forward. Kaylee, the inflation here is about the core, the trimmed, all the fancy global Wall Street. But for America, it's a number that's shocking and harkens back to the early 1980s. Yeah, the American people feeling this in every way. And Jerome Powell has recognized that, which is why initially he said the Fed is responding to headline inflation. But as Lisa and you both have mentioned, it is going to be more about the core today. And of course, inflation, Tom, is going to inform the Fed's policy path, how high that terminal rate ultimately is. And the research out of Bank of America overnight, if that terminal rate is priced at 4% or more, we could be looking at a yield curve that inverts more deeply, possibly down to negative 85 basis points. That is just astounding. We haven't seen that since right. the 80s. We're going to go over the curve inversion here in a bit, negative 48 basis points right now. Uh, Lisa, we have to pause the show and bring it to a complete halt on radio and television for our auction update. We had a three-year auction yesterday, a 10-year auction today that I don't care about. Let's do auction talk with Bramo. What's the so what on this, Lisa? You actually saw our lowest <laughs> ever dealer uptake of the three-year note yesterday. Basically, people are starting to see value at the front end that perhaps it's fully priced what the Fed is going to do. Today, we get $35 billion of 10-year notes. The reason why this is interesting is where Please. is the conviction trade at a time <clears throat> where the Fed is going to have to do more? We're going to get a CPI print that may show peak inflation. It may not, according to some. And so then where do you go when you look at bond duration and we look at some of the exposures, right. people going into the long end? Today, we'll see. We're going to address that in a moment with Chris Verone, not the equity market, but Verone focused on the bond market. Let me look at the data right now. Futures up nine, Dow futures up 62, NASDAQ green in the screen across. The VIX has really churned here for the last number of days, waiting for 8.30 this morning, 22.19 on the VIX in the fixed income space. I really don't know what to say. 3.25% in the two-year yield and the inversion, which will touch through the show, negative 48 basis points is extraordinary. Ian Lingen at BMO Capital frames out technicals that get a further inversion out to negative 56 basis points. I haven't even seen that number yet. Thank you, Ian, for bringing that to our attention. Oil pulls back from the drama yesterday in Russian, uh, uh, Russian oil pipeline. And now for some drama, the brief of the morning with the Bramowitz. Oh, incredible drama. 8.30 a.m. It will be dramatic. The U.S. July CPI figure, consumer price inflation, 
inflation. How much do we see that headline number being the one that people focus on, that the Fed focuses on as they talk about the deceleration in inflation? The headline number is expected to come down because of oil and gas prices coming down. However, core CPI expected to potentially even accelerate and real wages, as I was mentioning earlier, they have gone to the lowest going back to 2007. That's how far this data goes back uh, with nearly negative 4% real wages. That is how much the disposable income is going down for households in America as a result of the high inflation and wages not keeping pace. We're going to speak with Brian Deese from the uh, president's cabinet later this morning. What does he say about this? 10.30 a.m. we get EIA crude oil inventory report as we take a look at how tight the supplies are. Tom, you were saying that oil prices are coming down just a touch today. How do we dovetail this expectation for a fall off in demand with the real time data, which is inconclusive? Today we get a host of Fed speak, including Chicago Fed President Charlie Evans at 11 a.m. and Minneapolis Fed President this. Neil Kashkari Interesting. Interesting. at 2 p.m. alongside BlackRock's Larry Fink and Larry Summers, the former Treasury Secretary of the United States. Tom, we are not getting forward guidance anymore, except we are getting forward guidance. How do exactly. they spin what we've gotten at 8:30 a.m.? You absolutely nailed it. They're absolutely addicted. Get in front of the mics and pontificate about where we're going. I yearn for the days of Greenspan uh, silence. It was harder for Christopher Verone in the time of Alan Greenspan. They just had to really glean what the Fed was doing. Christopher Verone is with Macro Strategy at Strategus, a Baird company. We welcome him this morning. Chris, you turn your note upside down. It's not about the equity market. It's about the uh, bond market. Technically, you see two-year yields moving higher. Discuss. Yeah, I, I think the idea that the bond market buys this idea of a Fed pivot, uh, we just don't see it on the charts. I mean, two-year yields are basically back at the highs. If you look at the Fed fund futures for, say, next March, they're already back to 4%. We went back and we looked at every single tightening cycle back to the early 70s. We cannot find a tightening cycle where the Fed funds rate ultimately didn't end above the rate of inflation. So. This idea of peak inflation, that's just a math problem to us. I'm not sure it's investable. Even if you get CPI lower here over the next 12 months to seven or to five or to four, you still need a Fed funds rate above the rate of inflation. That's what the history has shown us. I think that's what the two-year yield is reflecting. I think that's what the shape of the yield curve is reflecting here as well. And it's very contradictory to the message from the market the last five, six, seven weeks. So we have an equity market responding to this. I now think overbought at resistance in a downtrend. I just don't love the risk reward here on bonds or stocks. Okay, so Chris, when you say overbought when it comes to stocks, I yeah. wonder how far you see the downdraft that is to come if the, your view is confirmed that the Fed has to raise rates a lot more and that the market has not yet gotten that reality check. Yeah, I think it's a, it's certainly a good question here. And I think what's been notable the last, let's call it two months as the market rallied, this has not been a rising tide. I mean, just look at the tape the last week or two. This is not every group, every stock, uh, every index working. We see the weakness in China. We see the weakness the last couple of days in semis. We see, I think, frankly, some of the growth in tech rallies starting to fray here a little bit as well. So I, I think this is more about risk reward. We're into resistance. Let's call it 4150, 4200 on the S&P. Um, I think lower here makes more sense. We'll see if that's right or wrong, but this has not been a rising tide this rally. That's what I think is most important. But Chris, where's the floor then? So our view all year has been everything's going back to where it was pre-COVID. And you're talking about, you know, 32, 3,400 on the S&P kind of gets you back to those pre-COVID levels. That's still <clears throat> our view here. Clearly the market's challenged that over the last five or six weeks, but you know, S&P up 15% over the last 30 days, right? That is an average right. bear market rally. So we haven't seen anything <clears throat> as extraordinary or remarkable to say, hey, this, this move's an outlier, this is something new. So we're sticking with the view that this is still a downtrend. I don't like the risk reward up here. Chris, a core issue in technical analysis is how do you do a stochastic time series? What that means, folks, is a pointy series that goes up and makes a sharp point or comes down and makes a sharp point. And Chris, that is a twos ten spread as a vanilla spread of a, of curve inversion. How do you yeah. study the twos ten spread if it's so pointy up and down? 
Well, I mean, we have to go back to April of 2000, the last time we had twos and tens kind of in this category of negative 50 or so basis points. But I think what's important here, when you look at the history of the curve, uh, believe it or not, the curve tends to get this inverted pre-recessionary, not during a recession. Actually, as you begin to enter an economic slowdown or a recession, actually the curve tends to steepen. Uh, so that, that first steepening that you see um, as the economy slows is not a bullish steepening. It's actually a message that, hey, the economy is slowing. So I want to be careful here if the curve steepened over the next couple months. Right. I don't want to misinterpret that. It would be normal for the curve to steepen into a slowdown. Chris, thank you so much. Christopher Verone, getting us started thank strong you. here with Strategus of Baird uh, a Company. Lisa, I want to dive into what we see when we parse inflation. I did in the 5 o'clock hour, goods and services. How will you parse inflation this morning? Uh, that's a great way to parse it because we've seen goods roll off. How much do services maintain that? I'm going to parse it between rent, between medical expenses, I, and yes, then on the yes. flip side, oil prices, which we know have been declining, and food prices, which on the margins also have been declining. And that goes to the core argument. The core is going to be so important because of those sticky aspects, that roving inflation that continues. Off of a 3% owner's equivalent rent, we are out about 3.6 standard deviations. That's been the spike in the rental, the living component that we have. And Kaylee, everyone's living that coast to coast. To me, socially and for President Biden, that's the key statistic. It is, and it's a political one as well, Tom. As we get closer and closer to <clears throat> November, that is what the American people are feeling and what a large majority of them are going to end up voting on is the state of the economy that they feel. And yes, the president has notched some points in his camp with gas prices coming <clears throat> down with that Inflation Reduction Act that has now been passed by the Senate. Is that enough, though, when we're still talking about prices that maybe aren't accelerating as fast but are still right. growing? I want to tell you about this morning, folks. We're really excited about the show. We've cleared out before the 8.30 report for the true expertise of Michael McKee. He will join us for that entire section to get you ready for the inflation uh, statistics. Emily Wilkins from Washington on the shock of Mar-a-Lago that we've seen in the last 24 hours. And of course, David Stubbs will join us from J.P. Morgan Private Bank. This historic day, an inflation report. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Ritika Gupta. In New York, former President Trump says he will be questioned today under oath about his dealings as a real estate mogul. The investigation involves claims that the Trump organization misstated the value of its prized assets for tax reasons. That comes two days after federal investigators searched the former president's home in Florida. Republicans echoed the assertion that the search was politically motivated. What's been called the most scrutinized economic report in the world comes out this morning and it will give us a sense of where the fight against soaring inflation in the U.S. stands. According to a Bloomberg survey, the Consumer Price Index probably increased at an annualized rate of 8.7% in July. That's down from June's figure, but still way above the Fed's 2% target. The CPI is out at 8.30 a.m. New York time. China has ended those unprecedented military exercises near Taiwan, but it says it plans to conduct regular patrols in the region. The Chinese began the drills last week after U.S. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi defied Beijing and visited Taiwan. Elon Musk has sold $6.9 billion of stock in Tesla, his biggest sell ever. The world's richest person says he wants to avoid a last-minute sell-off of the car maker's shares in case he's forced to go ahead with his deal to buy Twitter. Musk says he'll buy Tesla shares again if the deal doesn't close. And Bloomberg has learned that the U.S. Justice Department is preparing to sue Google for allegedly illegally dominating the digital ad market. The suit could be filed as soon as next month. Two years ago, the Justice Department sued Google in a case involving online search. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. got to believe that to go after a former president's home it, with a warrant, um, you have got to have the highest level of concern supporting uh, and, and, and that essentially justified by the probable cause finding. And I think that's the judgment that is telling here. 
Someone qualified. It's always good to speak to someone like Donald Ayer, former U.S. Deputy Attorney General there, on a hugely historic and emotional day for America yesterday, the search of a president's residence for documents, and of course that in Mar-a-Lago in Florida. We're going to focus on this now with Emily Wilkins, sort of day two after we pick up the debris. Emily, people publishing reporting Axios moments ago, Greg Vallier moments ago, CNN moments ago, and on and on. It seems to be a day of discovery. What is the biggest mystery we are trying to discover day two? Well, one of the big things they're trying to figure out is what led to this search warrant in Mar-a-Lago. You are hearing uh, from Republicans, particularly, I'm thinking like Mitch McConnell, has come out and said, hey, this search warrant, this is a big deal, this is unprecedented, and we need to know exactly what they're looking for. Now, at this point, we're seeing a number of reporting come out saying that it seems that uh, Trump, when he left the White House, took documents with him that should have been kept within the federal government's care, kept within the National Archives. Remember, Earlier, actually, folks from the National Archives came and retrieved about 15 boxes of papers from Mar-a-Lago. Uh, the Washington Post has reported that additional boxes were removed after the search yesterday. And so that seems to be one right. aspect of what they're looking into. I, I think kind of a big question, though, is what, what is in these documents? And is there anything in right. particular there that might segue into all these other investigations currently looking at Trump? Civics 101, can the president apply pressure on the attorney general to say this time is different off the Presidential Records Act of 1978, and can Biden say to Garland, let's get visible on this and at least explain what we're doing? Is that feasible? So obviously, Merrick Garland is a part of Biden's cabinet. At the same point, Biden has really tried to take a bit of a hands-off approach with the attorney general. Well, remember, Trump sort of did, we did see Trump try and put a lot of pressure on his attorney general when he was in office. Biden's trying to really break with that, say, no, the Merrick Garland is going to do what Merrick Garland needs to do. At the same point, I think that there are kind of rising questions around the transparency around this. And I think it's, it's valid to ask whether the current White House would be beneficial by trying to get more of that transparency as far as why the search was conducted, what they were looking for, and if there's going to be more revelations from that, that come from whatever documentation th they were looking for. As you mentioned, Emily, a lot of people are expecting President Biden to punt this issue to the Department of Justice, saying it is their terrain and they are independent. He also has enough on his hands. Today we're about to get a CPI report that highlights perhaps we've seen peak inflation, but that it's decelerating not to anything that is comfortable Still 8.7% is the overall assumption. How are they planning to position this? What's their arguing point? So Democrats are very well aware that inflation is going to be an issue that absolutely dominates the November elections. It's not going to be in their favor. It's really helping out Republicans right now. You're seeing so many Republican candidates and lawmakers really say, hey, you need to elect us this November so we can get inflation down. Democrats have really taken the tact of looking at the uh, CHIPS bill that they just passed, as well as that tax and climate bill that was passed in the Senate last week, is now going to be taken up by the House this Friday, and say, look, we're moving Moving this major legislation, it's going to lower costs, it's going to lower a prescription drug costs, it's going to lower energy costs, and through this, we're going to be able to provide relief to American families. So that's kind of what Democrats answer. It's not necessarily that they're going after inflation per se, but they're trying to go after the day-to-day -day things that most Americans buy. Emily, you raised that the House still has to vote on the Inflation Reduction Act, and it strikes me that there were a number of lawmakers from high-tax states, like here in the tri-state area of New York and New Jersey that were adamant about the salt cap, and yet that is not included in this bill. They're expected to vote yes all the same. I wonder how that plays for them in their home districts. I think that's a really great question, Kaylee. I mean, obviously, it's a huge issue for a lot of folks in the New Jersey and New York areas. At the same point, all these lawmakers were looking at a reality just a few weeks ago that they weren't going to get anything done on this particular issue. Nothing on, nothing more on health care, nothing more on climate, nothing more on taxes. Now they actually have something. And I think for a law, lot of lawmakers, the ability to have something, to have something to go home and tell their constituents about beats having nothing, even if it doesn't have have everything they wanted. I mean, let's be clear, there is a lot that was left out of this bill on the cutting room floor. A lot of voters right. understand that Democrats aren't getting there through everything they initially promised. But again, this is way more than we were expecting even a month ago. But Emily, do they go home 
to a dialogue forever changed yesterday with the search of a president's residence? I think obviously the search is unprecedented. It is a huge news story. On the other hand, it's not something that really impacts Americans in their day-to-day -day lives. Certainly for those who are maybe hardcore Republicans, hardcore Democrats will have thoughts and feelings about this one. But when you talk with lawmakers, particularly those who are running in the most difficult campaigns, the first thing they'll tell you off the bat is kitchen table issues. And whatever happened down in Mar-a-Lago this week isn't really impacting the average American family. Emily Wilkins, thank you so much. Greatly appreciate it this morning with a brief there on the news of Washington. Futures up 10, Dow futures up 73 in the VIX with that big churn around a 22 point. Lisa, we've hardly mentioned the equity market. Julian Emanuel over at Evercore ISI has really been outstanding about keeping track of the beans. And I'm sorry, revenue growth in reported earnings has been double digit, big, big inflation affected. Yeah, it's been inflation affected, and for now, it's been relatively strong. <laughs> it's been fascinating to see how even within the same shop, you have different strategists who are arguing against each other. And Julian Emanuel, one of his colleagues at BTIG, uh, account among those that do have conflicting narratives. This is a faith-based market in terms of where earnings margins are going to go. Yes, they've held in so far, but we've heard <laughs> from Mike Wilson at Morgan Stanley saying they're going to shrink. A lot of people looking at productivity, how much it's declining. A lot of people looking at the producer prices we're yeah. going to get tomorrow, <clears throat> CPI we're going to get today, putting it together and saying something's got to give. But what's got, I'm glad you bring this up, Lisa. I've been remiss on this. Productivity, I'm going to call it a three-ratio dynamic. A lot of moving parts here. But, Kaylee, what mattered yesterday was unit labor costs, which goes to what Lisa mentioned earlier, which is your wage after inflation mm -hmm isn't so good. Yeah, and that's going to be something crucial to watch as we have a conversation about whether the United States <clears throat> is heading toward a wage price spiral, Tom. Those labor costs yeah. are going to be critical, especially in services, as we watch the services metric in the CPI today. We'll do that at 8.30 here in two hours. Right now, dollar fractionally weaker. I don't want to make a big deal. Euro explodes out to a 102. That'll help John Farrell as he tries to get a plane back from Rome. <laughs> so we'll see how that... You're lobbying him. Tomorrow. Send him the gold stream, Tom. Inflation in two hours. Stay with us on radio and television. Good morning, everyone. Bloomberg Surveillance and Inflation Day. We're coming up on two hours away from... The, uh, the most important inflation uh, report I've seen in ages and ages. Kaylee Lines in for Jonathan Farrell. Lisa Bramwitz, of course, uh, with us today. And uh, looking across futures up 10, Dow futures up 74. The bond space. Lisa, let's do it right now. Curve inversion. There's the number on the Bloomberg terminal. Negative 48 basis points. It's shocking. We're bumping wow. up against history here, and people are saying it could go even further. Does this mean that bad things are going to happen in the economy? And you get really unclear answers from people I about agree. whether there is this yeah. sort of depth of the inversion and there's any correlation to the depth of a yeah. potential downturn. The operative word there is ambiguity. Maybe we see that in currency markets as well. On the holistic economy, on these inflation reports, and particularly with his expertise of the dollar, Mark Chandler is timely to speak to. He's chief market strategist at Bannockburn and truly legendary in the astrology, if you will, of piecing all this together. Mark Chandler, what does sustained high inflation do to the astronomy of the market? Uh, Tom, I don't know. I think that the uh, it's not just the U.S., of course, that has high inflation, but the world's going through it now. I kind of think that, uh, you know, to your point about the importance of today's CPI number, I'm not so sure that's going to really change anything. You know, after that strong labor day that we had before the weekend, the market's pricing in about an 80% chance of a 75 basis point hike next month. And I don't think the CPI number right. is going to change that very much. Is the dollar dynamics here playable? When you look at the noise, the David Rosenberg-like noise that's going to come out in the inflation report today, can an economist like you go over and make a playable bet on resilient, strong, or weak dollar? I don't know if it's just so much on today's CPI number, but the thing that I'm focusing on really is that even though uh, there's been this big rate adjustment, the spread between the U.S., two-year yield and the German two-year yield is at about three-year highs. And typically, 
that spread, that U.S. premium peaks before the dollar does. So I'm concerned be, between the uh, Italian election next month, the weather, the, this uh, unusual weather, we should say, in Europe, uh, drying up the rivers, also a new supply shock, as well as the energy costs. So I think that Europe is facing a couple of shocks in addition to that interest rate differential, and that could drive the euro back to, towards its lows. Well, and that's actually something I've heard from an increasing number of analysts, Mark, that perhaps we haven't seen peak dollar strength at a time where the U.S. is still doing pretty well. How much did the employment report on Friday change that picture? Are people getting sort of not false optimism, but overly confident about the healing of the global economy or the resilience of the global economy before they can see it actually happening? Yeah, I don't know. You know, I think Powell makes a good point that with inflation, there's one number we could, like, think the Fed could focus on, PCE uh, headline uh, infl deflator. But when it comes to the employment market, we are seeing a lot of mixed signals. Weekly initial jobless claims are rising. We saw some weakness in some of the survey data. Uh, we've seen continuing claims beginning to edge up. The labor market is not as strong, perhaps, as the non-farm payroll suggested. But again, the labor market's a lagging indicator. Uh, there's many people who think the U.S. is already in a recession. I'm not one of those people, but I do think that between the yield curve, and I would point out that yesterday, it's not just a two to 10 year curve that you're talking about, but did you see what happened yesterday? The one year T bill was auctioned at the same rate that the three year note went off yesterday. Yeah. 3.2%. And I think that really tells you, it's not to me, it's not, a, it's not that it's uh, reflecting a recession, but those changing in financial conditions make it more difficult. Yeah for businesses. I mean, Mark, hold on a minute. Lisa, was that auction talk with Bramo? Did I just hear that? <laughs> well, it wasn't with me. It was with Mark, but it was very well done. It was it very well done. I, I, about... admit, I, I nodded off. <laughs> well, that was beautiful, Tom. <laughs> that really read well on, on radio. <laughs> you know, Mark, other than nodding off with the bond auction talk, there is this question about positioning right now and the fact that people are going into uh, three-year notes at a time when there are so many questions about rate hiking. Has positioning in the Dollar made it more vulnerable to a rally because people have closed out their <clears throat> longs in this belief that we've already seen the peak. Yeah, but I don't know if we've really seen, seen that. I mean, of course, in a few currencies, there has been some adjustments. I think the market, the speculative market in the futures are, uh, are long Canadian dollars, for example, but they're still short the euro, they're still short sterling, uh, they're still short the yen, even though not as much as they were before. I'm not sure positioning is the big block for the dollar right now. I, th I think that it's really just a summer doldrums. And I think that as we get into uh, next month, I think they will see the dollar beginning to strengthen again. So what would be the concoction for dollar weakness, Mark? I mean, literally, what would it take in order to sap the strength of the greenback? Yeah, this is what I'll tell you what I'm watching. I know we're all looking at the Federal, Federal Reserve raising rates 75 basis points next month, maybe another uh, 50 or 75 before the end of the year. But when I look at the December Fed funds futures for next year, it's trading below the December Fed funds contract this year. That means the market's pricing in a rate cut in the second half of next year. And I think that as these forces gather steam, I think the market's concluding that the Federal Reserve is going to break something before they think they will. That is, that whether it's the labor market, whether it's the economy, things will slow down sufficiently between the end of this year, early next year, to put the Fed on hold. Some of my colleagues at ITC had done a study of how the lag time between the last <clears throat> hike and right. the first cut. And that's average around 10 months. So I don't think the market's so far off, even though the Fed pushes against it. We've mm -hmm. seen some easing of financial conditions. I think that still seems to be a reasonable bet that by the end of next year, we're talking about right. cutting a Fed policy. Mark, thank you so much. Mark Chandler with Bannockburn there, and it really uh, resounds with what we saw from Bank of America and a chart getting us out into the summer of 2023 with elevated uh, inflation. Yesterday, a surveillance edge of hysterical on the pipeline across Russia moving into Ukraine and splitting into three parts from Latvia down to, I can't remember where, Lisa, they shut down the oil. Brent went up a stick and a half. 
And now we go the other way. Well, we got a headline saying that Transneft is getting ready to resume the flow via that uh, southern yeah. leg of the pipeline. And there had been discussions, uh, th or this had been really a Ukrainian-led shutdown, not a Russian-led shutdown, which was part of the reason why you saw uh, oil getting lower today anyway ahead of this. There was an expectation that it would <clears> resume. <throat> Nevertheless, Tom, I do wonder what the premium is getting built into oil prices because there is an expectation yeah. that Russia is going to play with the flows. I mean, this is going to be something that's going to happen through the end of the year. Perhaps this isn't the perfect example of this, but that is something that many people are expecting. So how do you get ahead of that? And how do you plan for it if you're a trader trying to game out the pricing? And Kaylee, it's a calendar item. I mean, the heat's breaking in New York. We've gone from this ridiculous heat wave. I've never, folks, two days ago, I've never seen in the Northeast ever. It was like Virginia weather, Kaylee. It was terrible. It was, or the swamps of Washington, Tom. It has been brutal, but it's also been brutal in Europe. And while we're talking about oil and gas flows from Russia, we also have to talk about the effect this heat wave is having on Europe's rivers. There is a point in the on the Rhine River that by Friday could become <clears throat> impassable for cargo. That is also coal, which Germany has come to rely on to a much heavier, heavier extent, given all of the concern around Russian energy flows. We're talking about climate change. We are talking about an energy crisis crisis in Europe that could get worse because of it. And that does not leave the European economy in a very sound place. Yeah, John telling me central Italy and on down south has really been extraordinary the last couple days. We'll have to see what he says uh, when he gets back uh, as well. It's been really quite something. And of course, we're moving up here in two hours to the inflation report. I should note, Julian Lee, seriously, Dr. Lee will be with us uh, here in the seven o'clock hour on oil and on Europe as well. Something important for global Wall Street. Uh, Lisa, Netherlands, TTF, Natch Gas, uh, the moving average of that is frightening. It's amazing, Lisa, how the moving average that I use on Netherlands natural gas is sharply above where it was when the war started. Yeah, and what we've heard uh, from Javier Blas, also of Bloomberg Opinion, has been that you've started to see Germany in particular transition away from gas and try to increase reliance on oil and on coal, as Kaylee was talking about. How quickly can they do that ahead of the winter? I, you know, this is going to be a huge pressure point, a massive part of the inflation over in Europe. We're seeing that be a declining part of the inflation here in the United States. <clears throat> so then what takes over for it and how long can you yeah. count on that as the disinflationary measure of the headline number? John from the Hassler in Rome emails in. John, thank you for emailing in from the Hassler in Rome. And he says, why aren't you guys doing Italian spreads? I don't know, Lisa, why aren't we doing Italian spreads this morning? Because he's not here and we're on strike. I mean, he's <laughs> yeah, you know, exactly. drinking espresso you. and having buffalo mozzarella. And so <clears> we don't have to look at it. Look, this has been something that we've all been watching as well. Uh, what's been going on with Italian yields versus German yields and how that's shifted around, especially after... We have not necessarily seen the teeth of the European program of the ECB. Uh, they face a lot more problems in Europe. And that, I think, is basically yeah. the theme that we keep hearing. In the last 24 hours, Danske Bank has done some really terrific work on this. And, folks, it's important to understand on this day of inflation in the United States how different the European story is than what we see uh, in the United States. Uh, in in America, futures up nine. Dow futures up uh, 65, and the VIX 22.26 uh, this morning. Lisa, I want to go back to the bond market. We got to go back to this curve inversion story, and I guess the velocity of it can go right through. As I mentioned earlier, Ian Lingen looking at negative 56 basis points. I'm going to throw the Fed a bone. This could be actually viewed as real credibility by the Fed in the markets, at least right now. That people believe that whatever the Fed's going to do is going to work. And that's why long-term yields are coming down. And to me, that is my question. How long does that continue? Or at what point do people start pushing back, especially if they believe in this pivot right. of a Federal Reserve? Well, we're thrilled you're with us today, this most important day. Michael McKee with a complete inflation brief. We will do that at 8.15. We've got a number of economists to attend uh, as well. And then afterward, we will move on to the markets and particularly on to important earnings in media. Michael Nathanson will join us here to finish out surveillance this morning. Coming up, Rubila Faruqi, Chief U.S. Economist with High Frequency Economics, our first brief of the morning on this historic inflation report. Please stay with us. This is Bloomberg. Good morning. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Rishiki Gupta. Former President Trump has legal issues on two fronts. He says that today he'll 
testify under oath in a New York investigation involving the value of his real estate holdings. That comes two days after federal investigators searched the former president's home in Florida. Republicans echoed the assertion that this search was politically motivated. In the UK, households are already almost $1.6 billion in debt to their energy suppliers before winter, and that's when bills are set to surge again. British consumers typically build up credit with their providers during the summer when energy usage eases. That limits the shock of higher demand in the winter, but soaring gas and power prices have made this summer that much more expensive. And several of Europe's major rivers are running dry, disrupting $80 billion in trade routes. Blame it on an arid summer that has set heat records across the continent. The Rhine has dried up to the point of becoming virtually impossible at a key waypoint. That is slowing down vast flows of diesel and coal. And in South Korea, the city of Seoul is bracing for more rain after being hit by one of the worst storms in more than a century. Widespread flooding has killed at least nine people in the capital. More than 20 inches of rain have fallen. Opposition lawmakers are criticizing President Yoon suk yeol for his response. College endowments in the U.S. declined the most since the global financial crisis. They lost a median 10.2% before fees in the 12 months through June. That's according to Wilshire Trust Universe Comparison Service. The largest funds, those with $500 million or more, did substantially better, gaining 9 tenths of 1%. The previous year, endowments returned to a median 27%. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. The Fed right now, uh, it actually might be easier for them to continue to attack or at least try to bring under control this inflation issue while consumers maintain somewhat of a slow down but still spending so the economy can get through this. Anna Hahn of Wells Fargo on equities there talking up inflation because that's what everyone is talking up. Katie Lines this morning in for Jonathan Farrow, Lisa Bramowitz and Tom King. We welcome you all to a most historic day. And let's talk about that because we really haven't said inflation now that you're living top line core trim this trim that auction adjusted according to Lisa is a 40 year high inflation, whether it's 41 years or 38 years who cares? It's four decades that we haven't seen this inflation. Right now, what we suggest is it will roll over and we can extrapolate out a path in the next year, except it hasn't rolled over yet. Maybe we'll see that here in less than two hours. Rubila Faruqi is chief U.S. economist at High Frequency Economics. Our first conversation of the morning to dive into the details. Rubila, what is the detail beneath the headline data that matters at 8.30? You know, we all expect to see headline inflation decelerate in July. And, uh, you know, uh, our estimate is a little more uh, to the downside than it is uh, than the consensus. But it's really about core inflation, and we expect to see an acceleration. Uh, it's all about rents. And uh, what we see is a persistent push uh, that we're going to get over the next several months. You know, our estimates show that you know, oh, rents is shelter inflation is about five and a half percent. It's going to peak at six and a half percent. So that's going to keep the pressure on core CPI over the coming uh, months. And uh, really, it keeps the Fed in play on a very aggressive uh, policy stance. The, you know, our uh, our estimation, our judgment is that we're going to see a 75 basis point rate hike. If we see a very negative surprise today, everything's on the table, a full percentage point as well. Uh, you know, we can see 125 basis points through the rest of the year, slight upside to that, and maybe well, what, even... What you just said there is outrageous. You're suggesting if the inflation report goes the wrong way, we may be jawboning 100 basis points in the 9 o'clock hour this morning? This is exactly what we think. If all options should be on the table. Okay. Uh, if the Fed is expecting to bring inflation back down to 2%, Growth is secondary, inflation is in focus. Lisa, that's And the harsh. labor market is really, it really allows them, it gives them the leeway, it gives them the runway to do, to take action, to bring inflation down. And this is the way they're going to do it. Right. Base case is 75 basis points. 
but look out for a negative surprise, <clears throat> negative surprise wow. on inflation. Rubila, you, you said that you're a little bit out of consensus, and to put it into perspective, your 8.5% headline uh, projection is the lowest right. among the projections that we track here at Bloomberg uh, among economists. What are you seeing in terms of the decelerating factors that others perhaps are underestimating? Well, it's just the energy component, right? What we see, saw in gasoline prices, what we saw in seasonally adjusted prices, what we look at, we think there is more downside risk from that to the energy component. And that just means that we have a flat reading month on month that brings the you know year on year down to eight and a half rather than 8.7. Eight and a half, 8.7 really doesn't matter because at the end of the day, an eight handle on inflation, headline inflation is unacceptable. And what we're going to see, what we expect to see on core CPI is moving from a 5.9 to a 6.2. Uh, so, I mean, th these are just not numbers that are moving in the direction that the Fed wants to see and yeah. really, you know, to keep uh, track on keeping inflation or bringing inflation back down to target and keeping inflation expectations anchored. This is what they need to do. Rubila, one uh, feature of inflation that is sticky is a, tr a moving target, basically that the areas of inflation keep shifting, which is exactly what we've seen over the past year or so. How sticky are some of the increases that we're seeing in rents, in medical costs, some of these other areas outside of gas, outside of oil, outside of food? And that's, and this is a very good point, right? This is what we're looking at. We're looking at medical care inflation. And we're looking at shelter in particular rents because there is the, they have such a substantial weight in the index. So, uh, like I said, I don't think you know shelter is going to be a major factor. If we zero out core goods inflation and we keep you know uh, services inflation accelerating, we're still going to have inflation, core inflation that's going to be well above target over the next few months. This is going to be sticky. It's going to have a lagged effect. It's not going to you know we. The Fed itself doesn't expect PCE inflation to go back to 2% by the end of the year. We need to move in the right direction. Mm -hmm. And right now we are not. I mean, we're going to see headline inflation decelerate. We're going, we expect to see core CPI accelerate. That's not what the Fed wants to see. Well, Rabila, in services as well, there is a wage component to that. And Tom was bringing up, rightly so, earlier, the 10.8% jump we saw in unit labor costs yeah. in the second quarter and data yesterday. How close are we to the edge of a wage price spiral? You know, it's uh, it's difficult to assess right now. If the Fed is actually acting to rebalance the labor market, then we do expect to see a little bit of, you know, demand to, uh, you know, we're not seeing it in the labor market data right now. But, uh, I, I, you know, what we are seeing in the timely figures, which is the jobless claims numbers, that we are seeing an adjustment in the labor market. So I, I'm not sure that we're in a wage price spiral right now. We don't really see it. But, you know, this is something we are watching very closely because, like you said, unit labor costs surging, uh, ECI at all time highs and, uh, you know, average hourly earnings moving in the wrong direction. We're just not seeing the deceleration that we want to see. So, Rabila, in your best <laughs> estimate, what level of unemployment are we going to be at when we see inflation back down near 2 percent? It's really difficult to assess that because, you know, if you look at what the Fed is saying, uh, you know, they're saying maybe the situation is different. Maybe we can bring demand down without really causing a big uh, jump in unemployment. So it's really what we are seeing is we are seeing uh, a decline in openings. We're also seeing a decline in hiring. So maybe we can see a rebalancing without bringing the unemployment rate too much. But, you know, it is in our it, it is our expectation that the unemployment rate is going to move above 4 percent. That's all that the Fed's expectation. It's just that there's a wide range of uncertainty uh, around that forecast. Rubila, thank you so much for framing that. Rubila Faruqi with us there with high frequency economics. And again, yeah. folks, something we haven't talked enough about, which is oops, higher statistics, greater inflation. And Lisa, the shock at 831 this morning of framing 100 basis points, I'm not prepared for that. Well, if there is an upside surprise, how much do we end up with something like that being the conversation? But then again, the parlor game, I know you love it so much. We get the forward <laughs> guidance that isn't forward guidance that's just yammering later today uh, from the Fed members, including Neil Kashkari, who's come out as this amazing hawk after being among the most dovish members. How much can we really glean any <clears throat> insight from them other yeah. than Fed Chair Jay Powell himself, who does seem to, uh, I don't want to say lean dovish, but maybe perhaps gut check a little yeah. bit more severely some mm. of these other Fed officials. Kaylee, from the end of the year, 7% even. 7.5, 7.9, 8.5. We got a hope and a prayer in April of 8.3. We pulled back. No, 8.6. <laughs> 
9.1, and that gets me to where Liz Ann Saunders is, which is look at shelter. Look at rent and that. To me, that's the key number today. It is, and one we're going to be watching very carefully, Tom. Has inflation peaked, or was it going to be like inflation was transitory and we quickly learned it wasn't? My question is, if it is hot, can the Fed wait until September 21st? That is still uh, a long way away. That's a really interesting question. I mean, it's September. It, it, that, that bears study. That bears conversation. We'll do that with David Stubbs here. Futures up eight. The VIX, 22.34. This is Bloomberg. Stay with us. For the Fed right now, uh, it actually might be easier for them to continue to attack or at least try to bring under control this inflation issue. The Fed is open-minded, as the Fed always is. We are at an important inflection point in the inflation story. If you look at the 25% decline early in the year, I think that was the baking in of a mild recession. You know, the economy is not out of the woods. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrow, Lisa Bramitz, and Tom Keen on radio and television. A most historic Wednesday here on Inflation in 90 Minutes. Uh, Caden Lines in for John Farrow this morning. And Lisa, well, let's get to this so we can get to David Stubbs. The answer is nothing else matters except 8.30. That's pretty much true. I mean, honestly, we're looking at markets and they're trying to find direction and they're kind of lackluster because why trade ahead of something that could fundamentally shift the conversation you highlighted just a moment ago, Tom? Are we talking talking about 50 basis points are we talking about 100 basis points what is the differential in the fed trajectory after this print that we get at 8:30 a more optimistic tech coming up in moments with david stubbs of jp morgan kayla your observation if you look at the research overnight I'm watching the yield curve, Tom. We're already inverted by nearly 50 basis points. If we get a hot inflation print and that raises expectations of the terminal <clears> rate, Bank of America is saying we could go as low as negative 85. How much deeper can I the have inversion not seen get? That. I know Ian Lingen at BMO Capital Markets modeling out negative 50 out to negative 56 basis points. Negative 85 basis points is on the edge of Volcker um, as well. Let me do the data check right now so we can get to Mr. Stubbs. Futures up eight, now futures up 66. The VIX really showing the range bound 22. 2.30. The two year yield is stunning 3.27%. That's the number to watch at 8 30 this morning. The market watch off of what we see. Oil gives back off some pipeline news out of Ukraine, out of Russia, 89 on West Texas. Brent crude, $95 a barrel. Dollar churn slightly weaker as well. We need a briefing. It'll be knee deep in three and 10 year auctions. Oh, yeah. Here's Lisa Bramwell. <laughs> It'll actually be knee deep in the one story of the day, which is 8.30 a.m. We get U.S. July CPI. We're going to be talking about the headline figure, the expectation being by the survey 8.7%. We're going to be talking about the core figure expected to come in at a faster pace than the other, uh, the non core elements. I'm talking about real wages, which have continued to decline and are about negative 4%. This is the decline is, in the disposable <clears throat> income of individuals as they go around based on how much right. inflation Lisa, is that's for big wage This is absolutely the most important chart up. For those of you on radio, all you need to know is it's reality for 10 years and then there's some pandemic noise in the so-called integrand, Lisa, the amount, the duration of pain is really adding up. And you're seeing that on the margins at places like Walmart, at places like Target. You're seeing that with anecdotal evidence of people transitioning away from higher cost items to lower cost ones. You are seeing the most negative real wages going back to at least 2007. Yeah. At 1030 a.m., the one reprieve has really been oil. And you talked about the decline today on the heels of the resumption of flows. We do get the EIA uh, latest oil inventory report for the United States. How much does this give a sense of perhaps a bill in inventories or a lack of demand. We saw a little bit of evidence yesterday uh, suggesting that. However, a lot of people have called that into question, and this really does underpin how far that headline inflation print can keep declining. And today, Fed officials will come out and they'll talk about that CPI report. Don't call it forward guidance. I don't know what you want to call it, but we're going to hear from Chicago Fed President Charlie Evans at 11 a.m. and Minneapolis Fed President Neil Kashkari at 2 p.m. alongside BlackRock's Larry Fink and Larry Summers, uh, the former Treasury Secretary, who's been very outspoken, Tom, about how this Fed has been behind the curve, how they yeah. haven't been uh, exactly upfront with what they're looking for in terms of inflation, in terms of how high unemployment will have to get, and how quickly that rate can come down and how much pain 
the economy might have to suffer. Let's do this now. We're going to get to the inflation questions with Lisa and Kaylee. But right now, someone who gave me my essay of the summer 12 months ago, David Stubbs out of LSE and New School of Social Research, uh, wrote an incredibly prescient piece last year on technology. He joins us from J.P. Morgan Private Bank. I want to do a segue here into inflation, but the technology of the moment, which defines, as you said last summer, the haves and the have-nots of the American economy, they're affected differently by inflation. The technology winners are not as hurt is the technology losers. Absolutely, Tom. This has been one of the key drivers of the, the growth in wealth inequality, income inequality in, in the US and right. across most of the developed world, of, uh, for sure. And certainly when you uh, when you are faced with such a, a major inflation right. push in the core necessities of food and gasoline and rent that we are seeing, and we're going to see again right. um, you know, in, in just a, a short while, it absolutely lays, uh, lays bare some of the weaknesses and some of the fragilities of the right. majority of the working age population uh, in the developed world. You get four weeks left in the summer. I said to Joyce Chang, be sure Stubbs writes a decent thing on technology here before the end of the summer. Lisa? <laughs> well, perhaps technology, but also perhaps Goldilocks. We all love that story. Mm -hmm. And uh, you see, David, the potential for a Goldilocks type event if you get a miss in the CPI print. If it comes in lower than expectations, then you could see a surge in the S&P. Can you explain that, given that so many people see the risks as the other way, that there won't be that much of a move in markets because people have already priced in the pivot if you get a downside surprise but an upside surprise will start to really incur some pain. Yeah, Lisa, let's be very clear what this is. This is a discussion of markets over the summer. They tend to be uh, thin. They tend to be a little volatile. And the market is desperate for some kind of hard evidence that the inflation surge is lessening and the uh, Fed won't have to do as much as some people fear and that the soft landing is likely. And if that uh, is the message from the, the coming CPI report, absolutely, you could see um, risk assets rally very uh, significantly today and, and probably back it up tomorrow as well. But these are short-term uh, short moves uh, for sure. Ultimately, we do see a lot of downside in the equity market if we do get a recession. For, and and as we, your previous guests have been discussing for the last you know, hour and a half or so, the message from the CPI report is probably going to be core sticky inflation around things like rents continuing to accelerate even as headline pulls back. So we are entering, I think, a new phase in the inflation debate, one where Key drivers of the last you know, uh, nine months or so around food and energy start to reverse a little bit. But ultimately, the Fed focuses on core more than headline. And the core message from core is still going to be worrying. And it's still going to mean the Fed's going to do a lot more uh, in the three meetings it's got uh, throughout the remainder of this year. David, is it fun to be a strategist right now as you try to game out all of the <clears throat> potential uh, ambiguities and try to come up with uh, what people should do with their money? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's always fun to be a strategist, Lisa, because there's always a lot of interesting things going on. But we have been through uh, an, a whirlwind of a cycle. I mean, we see clear evidence at the moment of late cycle behavior. Look at unit labor costs you were referencing earlier. Look at the um, the lack of labor supply growth. Look at the obviously the acceleration in inflation and wages. Uh, you know, only you know, 12 months ago, 18 months ago, we were talking about early cycle conditions. So the, we are still in the shadow of COVID, and it is throwing. Uh, all kinds of traditional relationships out the window, making it very difficult for all market participants, not just strategists. Yeah. Okay, well, which one is more confounding, the equity market or the bond market? <clears throat> I think the equity market rally has gone a little far, for sure. For sure. I mean, there's a, so many uh, items of evidence uh, that, uh, that the global economy is slowing rapidly, that uh, corporate uh, um, earnings are going to come under pressure from margins. And the message from the bond market makes a lot of sense, and that is that you know, central banks are going to have to do a lot more, that they are credible, that we have uh, you know, an inflation targeting independent central bank framework that's going to do what it's designed to do, which is bring inflation back down to target. But it's going to have to flirt with recession at the very best mm. outcome to do so. And that is why you have the very significant curve, in curve inversion you've been discussing about. And it looks set for me for that, kind of curve, that curve inversion to, uh, to get even larger as you move into the fourth quarter. Evidence of slowdown continues to, uh, to stack up. And yet uh, central banks have to continue to hike rates. Yeah, and that's the camp that Bank of America in as well. And of course, the reason that the curve is inverting is that we've seen this short end move substantially higher. And we're seeing yields come in at the long end, which in theory, David, lower yields should be somewhat supportive of equities, specifically those that are in the growth realm. Is that still a good thing if the reason yields are lower is because growth is slowing down? 
Well, I, I think uh, mechanically, of course, interest rates help with the discount rate and anything that's a growth asset with the earnings that are way out into the future you know, gets impacted. <clears throat> and certainly we've seen growth outperform value since mid-May. And two things caused that, I think. One is that you saw jobless claims start to rise. And that was the first sign that, hey, like the economy and the labor market really is um, starting to show a few cracks uh, you know, uh, you know, around the edges. And also you saw that mm. move in, in interest rates. And that's what boosted, uh, boosted growth. Now, of course, if the interest rates keep going down, it's probably not because uh, the Fed is credible and they're getting a handle on inflation. It's because the economy is sliding into recession. Mm. And that shouldn't be good for any part of the equity market. Let's go to the geometry taught at the London School of Economics about smooth glide paths, as the great Peter Orzeg puts it. Mm. Do you perceive the descent of core inflation into 2023 is a smooth, measured glide path, or do we move down and pause? move down and pause? Well, I think, firstly, we're going to continue to go up in the, in the coming months, Tom. But absolutely, you'd, you'd love to think that when we get to, uh, you know, the fourth quarter, the, the course starts to decelerate certainly year on year. And then that glide pass is reasonably uh, is reasonably smooth. Driven by goods disinflation? Driven by goods and also ev eventually moving into services. Look, services ex energy, which includes uh, rents, is the really worrying part of, uh, of inflation right now. And the Fed needs to see that roll over. It's mm -hmm. not going to roll over for a good, a good few months yet. But it should do is going into next year, as your question uh, you know, right. uh, lays out. What is the, I think, the big debate and quite scary for, in some ways is you could get inflation coming down to, say, 4% annualized in the first quarter of next year and, then it's and just stay there. there. That's the issue. That, I Be totally agree with this. Because, because you, you, that's certainly a, a good possibility, and that would prevent central banks around the world from cutting, cutting next summer, cutting the end of the year, whatever, whenever you want to right. assume that they'd be able I'm, to cut. I'm running out even of time. If you have an this recession. is brilliant, David. I'm running out of time. To be clear, you're saying services... X energy, yep. X shelter is what the sub index you're watching. Well, well services at X energy is is almost fifty percent of the of CPI, so that's the one that's that's uh, straight away. You absolutely want to focus on shelter. Also, things like hospital costs. Sometimes you take that out to get right. a core core measure. But Tom, if you, talk, you start removing too many okay. things, it doesn't make any sense. So, the, services no. X energy is what I'm focused on. Doctor Stubbs, don't be a stranger. David Stubbs of J.P. Morgan giving a fabulous brief uh, this morning here on inflation, equity markets with a little bit of a bounce. I'm not going to oversell it. Futures up 11. NASDAQ goes out up three tenths of a percent as well. The VIX 22.25. Please stay with us again in our next hour. Michael McKee will prepare you for the inflation report. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Ritika Gupta. What's been called the most scrutinized economic report in the world comes out this morning and it will give us a sense of where the fight against soaring inflation in the U.S. stands. According to a Bloomberg survey, the Consumer Price Index probably increased at an annualized rate of 8.7% in July. That is down from June's figure, but still way above the Fed's 2% target. The CPI is out at 8.30 a.m. New York time. And in New York, former President Trump says he will be questioned today under oath about his dealings as a real estate mogul. The investigation involves claims that the Trump organization misstated the value of its prized assets for tax reasons. That comes just two days after federal investigators searched the former president's home in Florida. Republicans echoed the assertion that the search was politically motivated. China has ended those unprecedented military exercises near Taiwan, but it says it plans to conduct regular patrols in the region. The Chinese began the drills last week after U.S. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi defied Beijing and visited Taiwan. Elon Musk has sold $6.9 billion of stock in Tesla, his biggest sale ever. The world's richest person says he wants to avoid a last-minute sell-off of the carmaker's shares in case he is forced to go ahead with his deal to buy Twitter. Musk says he'll buy Tesla shares again if the deal doesn't close. And New York City is one step closer to rolling out a congestion plan that would charge some drivers up to $23 to enter Manhattan's central business district. The toll could take effect as soon as the end of next year. It's estimated the charge would reduce traffic in the district by up to 9%. Global News, 24 hours a day on Aaron on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Rishika Gupta. This is Bloomberg.
you've got food and gas prices coming down. You've got Biden having a pretty darn good summer. So it's possible that maybe the Democrats' losses will only be five or 10 seats in the House. Maybe the Democrats will keep the Senate. But I can't see the House staying Democratic. I, I think the House will flip. Greg Villiers, I sure noticed yesterday off the shock of what we saw in the search of President Trump's residence in Florida. We discussed that in the last hour with Emily Wilkins, and we go to that right now before we go to inflation here in near an hour. Emily Wilkins hearkens from the great Northwest, as it was called years ago. There's the upper, the lower peninsula of her Michigan. And off to the west, I believe, lonely and cold is Wisconsin. We get a brief from Emily Wilkins of what we learned the first Tuesday of this week uh, where we had elections. Emily, what did we learn in Wisconsin? Always an interesting, twisted state. Oh, yes. Wisconsin is really going to be one of the states to watch. It is going to help determine whether or not Democrats wind up keeping the Senate or not. Uh, you saw Democrat Mandela Barnes uh, win the Democratic nominee. Uh, that was kind of expected. You saw a lot of other Democrats who are running drop out and endorse him in recent weeks. He's going to be up against Ron Johnson, the current Republican <coughs> senator from Wisconsin. Uh, he has caused a good amount of controversy in recent years with his remarks on COVID-19. He's also very much loyal to Trump uh, and has sort of been seen as having very close ties with the former president. Wisconsin, though, it's an interesting state. It is a swing state. It's a state that had elected a Democratic governor, but at the same point, you've seen a lot of Republicans also <clears throat> be elected at that time. And so I think it's going to be one of the ones where we're going to be seeing a yeah. lot of money spent, a lot of time spent from now until November. Well, I agree with the swing statedness of it. After the events of the last 24 hours, how does that affect swing state politics? Does President Trump surge because of Republican outrage over these searches? To a certain extent, yes. I think Greg Vallier really did an excellent job laying this out in his newsletter, that to a certain extent, what happened yesterday was a bit of a lifeline for Trump. It put him back on the uh, front page of the headlines. Uh, the search at Mar-a-Lago really united a lot of the Republicans behind him, including a lot of folks who were considering challenging him for the 2024 Republican nominee. And so Trump is really having a boost right now in the support that he's seen after the search. Um, and that could could really translate to some right. more strength for him and for his brand. Well, but Emily, there's been a question about how Republicans will handle this. And pretty much across the board, they've had the same kind of message, which is questioning the validity of this type of search. Is it having the same sort of support in the populace? In other words, from the polls, is this supporting some of the Republican candidates that have Trump's backing? Well, to a certain extent, if, if candidates are trying themselves to Trump, and many of them are, and Trump's brand goes up, that can certainly be seen as a positive thing for them. At the same point, I would just sort of reiterate that a lot of this election, it's going to be decided upon things like inflation. I mean, the CPI numbers coming out today are going to be really important as to what's going to happen in November. Same thing with abortion rights, given the overturning of Roe yeah. versus Wade. Those are kind of going to be the big movers <clears throat> and shakers in the November election. Certainly a lot of folks, they're watching the January 6th. They're watching what's happening with Trump. A number of them might be watching right. uh, the deposition that's going to happen today. But to a certain extent, those aren't things that the average American thinks about every day, even though they obviously are very important stories within our nation. And Kaylee, it's already happened here. Emily Wilkins always gets me in trouble. Nathan from Milwaukee tweets in and says, Tom, you're, dis you're disparaging Wisconsin. We are <laughs> not lonely. We're cold, which is, I guess, something okay. to consider about Milwaukee and points West. Important clarification. I'd yes, I would have liked to be cold over the last uh, week or so during this heat wave. Emily, you mentioned the deposition by the New York Attorney General today. How consequential is that for the former president? Well, we knew that Trump was going to have to sit for this deposition. It was supposed to be last month. It was moved following the death of his first wife. Certainly, this is an investigation that's been long going, but we've also heard Attorney General Letitia James say that they think that they are close, that they have a lot of evidence, that they are ready to actually move from the investigation to the point where there are actually going to be charges involved. And so that's going to be something to look at very closely. You know, there are a lot of investigations going on right now. It's not quite clear what the results is going to be from a number of them. Uh, so this certainly right. seems like one that's nearing the end. Uh, Emily, a difficult question, uh, very quickly here. If the Republicans are the party out of power, do they want high inflation or do they want low inflation? 
Well, I think if you ask any Republican lawmaker, they're going to tell you that, of course, they would like inflation to Thank be low. You. But this is yes. an excellent talking point for Republicans. I mean, they can really sort of pin this on average American yeah. going to the grocery store, going to the gas pump, seeing higher prices. I mean, they know that this is going to be an issue. If you look at the TV ads, if you look at the messaging, you're going to hear about inflation, inflation, inflation from Republicans until now, until November. Um, of course, then the big question is exactly what are Republicans going to be doing to address inflation if if they win the House and potentially the Senate. Emily Wilkins, thank you so much. Greatly appreciate that as well. And of course, Lisa, you know, my metric here is what Unilever is doing with Marmite, and they're up 11% in prices pretty much across the board at Unilever. I mean, Marmite inflation is a major concern for young Pharaoh and, and for you as British. well. Yeah. No, I don't eat the stuff. I, you know. You're just <laughs> stick with tag. I, well, I mean, you I, are saying I, this I let Vet Bill sniff it and he walked away. <laughs> and he, he no rolled way. over and passed yeah. out. Honestly, we are seeing uh, what we're in earnings across the board that revenues are increasing, but it's because of inflation. And yes, companies can increase the price. Yes. But I was looking at Wendy's, which just reported earnings oh, about please. 25 minutes ago. Thank you. And same store sales were actually lower even though the headline beat and you could see those shares sinking it's just an example of how people are looking at how much real growth are you experiencing and there isn't that much across the board you're not seeing real growth you're seeing inflation adjusted issues uh, really across the board to your marmite point tom yeah well you know and i'm looking here kaylee at, at, at wendy's i'm glad you bring this up lisa because i've got a nodding acquaintance this summer with Wednesdays, Wednesdays, when, Wednesdays. Wednesdays. <laughs> well, w it is a Wednesday. I have a nodding acquaintance still, with that too. Still G -G sees free cash flow of 215 million because of afterthoughts, endless orders on Seamless. There it is. It's in the report. I do love a good frosty, Tom. So uh, I'm right there with afterthought. I think I what's interesting so talking about kind of these inflationary pressures and shifting consumer behavior. Did you see the Bank of America data? out yesterday on credit card spending actually slowing down yeah. in July, which really speaks yes. to what we've been talking about. Rents going up, other costs that people are facing going up. That may mean less discretionary well, spending. Lisa, these are the, I'm glad Kaylee brings this up. Lisa, this is the back and forth, whether it's somebody looking for quiescent numbers or somebody saying, like uh, Rubila, uh, Farouk was stunning that we could see numbers go up. Yeah, and how much does the Fed respond to one print, especially when it could get revised? I, I don't know. I Part mean, of the interest here, one we'll hour have away. Non forward guidance later today. Yeah, we will have to see. We're going to be doing this, and of course, we'll bring you full market coverage after 8 30 as well. Futures right now set up 11. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg. Surveillance, we welcome all of you. John Farrell off today. Kaylee Lines in with Lisa Bramlett. I'm Tom Keane. And here now, coming up exactly on one hour to an extremely anticipated complex inflation report. We'll get to that with Marilyn Watson of BlackRock here uh, in a moment. Some good guests. Really looking forward to talking to Michael McKee at about 8.15, 8.16 to dive into all the data and all the mysteries he's looking at um, as well. The mystery in the data front is simple, a two-day, three-day churn to the markets awaiting this key report here in one hour. Futures up 10, Dow futures up 64. NASDAQ advances by three-tenths of a percent, but I wouldn't make much of it with a VIX 22.28. In the yield space, it's simple. There is a grind to further curve inversion. Negative 48 basis points is extraordinary on a two-year yield higher at 3.27%. Let's leave it at that and look at individual securities. Here's Lisa. Tom, we're about 91% done with the earnings so far for the S&P 500 in terms of the number of companies. And individual stories are fascinating. Let's take a look at some of them. Roblox, we were talking about that yesterday, how people were using fewer video games, in particular kids who actually have other things to do. And you're seeing this across the board with all video game producers. You're seeing those shares plummeting in pre-market trading down 15%. Those shares are already down more than 50% heading into this session for the year. This is because of a disappointment in the user because of the trend that we're talking about. Tesla shares, interesting to see them popping uh, on the heels of the report that Elon Musk sold nearly $7 billion of his stock. So why are the shares up 1.3%? Basically, his argument was he wants to get ahead of some sort of fire sale that he'd be forced to do should he be forced to buy Twitter as they deal with the contract negotiations there. And Coinbase came in with disappointment uh, on the heels of the crypto asset meltdown of earlier this year. Those
those shares lower uh, by 5%. In other stories that I know, Tom, you are very keyed into, the rights to broadcast the Big Ten, the football games of go. the big colleges. That is what we are seeing in Disney and Paramount, the parent company of CBS. Disney reports earnings after the bell. Those shares up nine-tenths of a percent. Their ESPN dropped the rights to stream Big Ten. Paramount Global, or CBS, partnered with NBC to pick those rights up, and those shares up six-tenths of a percent. This is really the key debate. How much can the prices for the streaming rights continue to gain, given that cable depends so much on sports for their survival and I'm very curious for what Disney says about why they were okay dropping that uh, in their earnings call after the bell and Wendy's we were talking about down 2.3 percent after reporting revenues that disappointed Shocking. as well as same store sales in the United States that also disappointed even though on an adjusted EPS standpoint they did beat so Tom really highlighting how people right. are looking under the hood for longer term resilience in order to figure out where to go uh, at least their bets. thanks so much greatly appreciate that on inflation now here less than one hour away to this historic report. We're thrilled to bring you Marilyn Watson. Yes, she's head of global fundamental fixed income strategy at BlackRock, but far more. She has parchment on at Cambridge. She did not study with Thomas Malthus, and I don't even think studied with Alfred Marshall, but along the way, she figured out the dynamics of price change within our economy. Marilyn, what's the key dynamic here for President Biden as he looks at this inflation report this morning? Well, I think certainly um, looking at this inflation report and the following one as well before we get the, the next uh, Fed decision in the end of September, I think will be crucial. And I think particularly with the midterms coming up as well, when you look at the core um, CPI, we expect it to remain pretty strong, not as high as 0.7% month for month um, in the previous month. But nevertheless, we think it will remain pretty high, maybe 0.5. And I think when you see that running um, annualized right. basis at over 6%, that's incredibly high. I think also when you look at the data today, we could see in terms of the headline data, it could come down a little bit in terms of um, a little bit of a drop in gasoline prices. But when you look at the overall economy and you look at the economic activity, we are starting to see the impact of inflation really coming through in terms of expenditure and other forms of economic activity as well. We're seeing a decline, as we saw in the jobs, uh, jobs opening, um, which is still remain elevated. But, you know, employers right. do have fewer vacancies out there as well. So I think it has a massively fundamental impact on the economy when you look at the prospect for the Fed, when you look at the amount of uh, money that households have in their pockets, when you look at business um, you know, right. investment, I think across the board, <clears throat> when, it's absolutely key. When you look at the timeline here, and let's go beyond the, the hysteria of one report that we're going to see here in mm -hmm. 50 minutes. If you take a BlackRock timeline out into 2023, do you just assume price down, yield up for fixed income if inflation doesn't get back to a 2% level? So we certainly think that inflation will start to um, you know, decline and, and certainly it will soften from here given base effects and a number of other issues. However, there are a number of you know, factors in play that I think are key and those are both you know, supply and demand. So if you look at energy, you look at the ongoing issues obviously with um, the Russia invading Ukraine with that. If you look at food, if you look at the friction still in some supply of goods, when you look at maybe potentially further lockdowns in China, there are a whole range of issues that may serve to keep inflation more uncertain than likely. And I think also that would be one of the key things that we look at when we see Jackson Hole later this month will be to see what the, you know, the world's major yeah, central bankers Yeah, but what does it do? What is your bet on price of fixed income paper? I think it's a major, major mystery here if price can get a bid in fixed income. Yeah, so I think in terms of fixed income, um, you know, the market here is pricing in uh, much more of a negative outlook than the equity market is, for sure. And that's when you see the inversion in the curve that you can see at the moment. That's certainly being priced in. I think at the moment, you know, we expect the yield to remain maybe in a sort of range going through to September. But I think going forward, there is a bid for fixed income because now when you look at other asset classes like further down the spectrum, not only in investment grade, but in high yield, you can really start to see some incredibly attractive valuations in fixed income. And I think you are starting to see a bid there for those that you haven't seen for a very, very long time. So I think in terms of pricing, I think, you know, the, the prices will remain supported by end investors, by pension funds, insurance companies. Well, and any investors who need the yield, 
But, but, never, but with cognizant that there is, you know, a lot of uncertainty around, um, you know, the economy going forward. Marilyn, how much conviction do you have? How much conviction does the BlackRock view have in terms of piling mm -hmm. in on top of the trade, given the support that you see for these pricing? So, I mean, we are still relatively cautious given the, the ultimate outlook and trajectory for, for the economy, but we expect it to remain relatively robust for the rest of this year. We also expect inflation to soften, as I mentioned, but still to remain elevated and far above the 2% target. So we do have, you know, a, a decent amount of conviction that if you can find high-quality assets that do have a very attractive yield, and we're starting to find more and more and more of those, when you can really see those assets from a bottom-up perspective, then we do have, you know, some pretty strong conviction that we're seeing some very attractive assets in the fixed income space right now. What are you looking Much for? Much more than we have in a long time. Yeah, well, I can imagine just based on the absolute yields being a lot higher, mm -hmm. but what are you looking for, Marilyn, before you go all in? So we're looking, obviously, um, at the, the, the balance sheets. We're looking at cash flow. We're looking at, you know, how robust different corporates and issuers are, particularly as we do see this slowdown in the economy. I think that's crucially important. We're also looking at in terms of um, leverage, things like that. Those are important. But I think also liquidity is incredibly important. So, I mean, for us to invest in bonds, we really need to do a lot of analysis and really understand exactly how liquid a bond is, the price we go in at, if something happens in the market, if there's a spike in either direction, if you want to change our um, positioning quickly, where will the liquidity be then and where will the price be then? So I think there are a range of factors that we need to take into account. But I say we do have a lot more confidence now in terms of, I think, the depth of the market and the yield that we can get. And it's really now focusing on a bottom-up perspective on the quality, the liquidity and the balance sheets of the company. Marilyn, finally, we were speaking with Greg Peters of PGM yesterday, who said spreads are not yet attractive enough in credit for me to be interested. I'm just looking at high yield right now, 432 mm -hmm. basis points north of treasuries. They've come in substantially mm -hmm. just in the last month and a half. How much do you think those could actually widen out? Yeah, so they have come in considerably. And I think when you look at um, what the market is pricing in in terms of the default rate um, and other issues, then... I think, you know, the, I think we are in a pretty benign environment right now. I think you could see uh, spreads potentially widen a little bit when you do start to see a little bit more dispersion. I think, you know, the next couple of months are tricky because it's the summer trading months with August. Then we have the Fed in September. And we will see a lot more key data coming through that will really, I think, help us to give a much stronger signal on the further trajectory of interest rates, inflation, and also the path of, growth um, and the labor market as well. So I think when we get past the summer, we could start to see more volatility then as we really start to understand exactly the tra trajectory of the economy. And from there, we <clears throat> could start to see maybe spreads widening a little bit depending oh. on the data set. Marilyn Watson, thank you so much with BlackRock today. And Lisa, I think that's a terrific insight from Marilyn that we've got to get quote unquote past the summer. In series after series, Lisa, that I bring up on the Bloomberg, we have to remind ourselves it hasn't turned around yet. These are these are vectors moving upwards, and they continue yeah. to move upwards. And there is a question, as Chris Verone said, sure, peak inflation is just math, but we don't even know if we're going to get that, right? I mean, mm -hmm. no one's projecting for inflation to increase from 9.1%. From but what if you get an increase in core inflation? What if you don't get any decline at all? What does the market do with that? I mean, honestly, we haven't <clears> seen it, to your point, Tom. And I think that's looming large over a very liquid and uncertain summer. It's going to be interesting to see. Right now, a little bid to the equity markets. Futures up 10. Uh, Dow futures up uh, 62 as well. Kayla Hines, I look at inflation. And again, we go to the political imperative. Brian Deese, I believe, with Lisa in the 9 o'clock hour. We'll bring that to you on radio and television. And Kayla, it's going to be interesting to see as we are mystified by where we are. The White House has to be mystified by where we are. And they have to message around it. Something tells me, Tom, mm -hmm. that the president is going to point Americans to the price at the gas pump and say, but I look, it's coming that down. Be, that's a perfect segue into Julian Lee. We will speak to him about oil, gasoline, and Dr. Lee's petrol as well. Then we'll get back on the inflation script, including Michael McKee with a brief before that report in 45 minutes. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Ritika Gupta. Former President Trump has legal issues 
on two fronts. He says that today he'll testify under oath in a New York investigation involving the value of his real estate holdings. That comes two days after federal investigators searched the former president's home in Florida. Republicans echoed the assertion that the search was politically motivated. The largest oil refiner in Hungary says it has resolved a dispute that led to a halt in oil flows to Central Europe. European sanctions had prevented Russia from paying a transit fee to Ukraine to let the oil pass through. Now the Hungarian refiner says it has paid Russia's transit fee and oil will resume flowing. Several of Europe's major rivers are running dry, disrupting $80 billion in trade routes. Blame it on an arid summer that has set heat records across the continent. The Rhine has dried up to the point of becoming virtually impassable at a key waypoint. That's slowing down vast flows of diesel and coal. SoftBank expects to post a gain of more than $34 billion from selling down its stake in Alibaba. That will reduce its stake in China's e-commerce leader from almost 24% to less than 15 The investment in Alibaba was one of the most lucrative in venture capital history. And the maker of the world's iPhones, Taiwan's Hanhai, posted quarterly profit that beat estimates. Demand for the company's cloud products helped it weather supply chain snarls and sluggish smartphone demand. Hanhai has been navigating component shortages, patches of weakness in the economy and COVID-related logistics bottlenecks in China. Global News 24 hours a day on Aaron on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. Despite the fact that price inflation is so elevated, financial conditions, what have they been doing over the last couple of weeks? Well, they've been easing. So to me, that suggests that the Fed has a lot more room to go. Um, I think the die is cast now for a 75 basis point move uh, at the September FOMC meeting, and they need to leave it on the table for the remaining two meetings this year. Neil Dutta getting out on the calendar into the fall and the great mystery of what we're going to see when inflation and again how it folds into our lives. Lisa really mentioning this morning the effect on wages and also of course what it means for Chairman Powell. I should note that we will attend Jackson Hole to give you perspective there from the world's leading academics on economics. John Farrow's off today stuck in Rome. Uh, Kaylee Lines uh, with us. Uh, the good sets. Kaylee thank you for joining us well, thank you, uh, this Tom. morning. Greatly appreciate that. Lisa Bramwitz and Tom Keene here. Uh, 45 minutes away from an important inflation report. Part of that inflation is oil. It's something we're all living here. We're not back to VW rabbits and what we knew in the 1970s. This time is different, but then maybe it's not. Julian Lee joins us now. Oil strategist at Bloomberg barely describes his academics at the London School of Economics and his ability to do the maths of the University of Warwick as well. Julian Lee, I want to talk about the character of oil and a gallon of petrol, a liter of gas in this inflation that we have. Do you perceive oil inflation as a permanent inflation? No, I, I don't think it's, it's permanent. I mean, we've already seen over the last month or so that uh, gas prices are coming down. So that is going to have um, at least you know, comparing month on month, that's going to be negative for inflation. Um, yes, it's it's up a lot year on year. Um, but, you know, I don't think we're going to continue to see it rising. I think that you get to a certain point where uh, higher oil prices start having their own um, self-correction mechanism, if you like, contributing uh, to economic slowdown. Uh, and that tends to bring prices back down again. And I think we will... Right. You know, we will see that happen. I've been so through so many of these cycles. Okay, but Julian, you and I flunked exams at LSE on this. This is what drives our listeners and our viewers nuts. Oil was two dollars a gallon. It's now four dollars a gallon. Oil price went up, and people like you say, "Well, we'll get used to it, and the inflation will go away." One hundred percent of our listeners and viewers say that's absolute baloney. Oil, a gallon of gas is still $4 a gallon. Yeah, a, a gallon, you know, a gallon of gas is, is about $4. A month ago, uh, it was over five. In some places, it was, was pushing six. Uh, so, you know, this is, this is a movable 
um, feast. It's it's a movable price. It, it's you know you track the history of uh, whether it's crude oil prices or uh, gasoline prices uh, over uh, the long the long history, and you correct it for inflation. Um, and yes, you you may see some uh, upward movement and and in, t in times very strong upward movement. Yeah. But you also see lengthy periods of downward movement. Julian, at 8.30 a.m., we're going to get CPI. After that, we're going to hear from the White House at 9.30. And potentially, they will come out and say, look, we got oil prices down. Look at how much they have declined over 56 straight sessions. Is it because of the release from the Strategic Petroleum, Re Petroleum Reserve? Is it because of a decline in demand? Is it because people are just speculating there will be a decline in demand in the face of a weakening economy? I think probably yes, yes, and yes. Um, all of those things, I think, have contributed. Certainly, uh, the release of crude from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve has had an impact on supplies globally. Uh, the concern looking forwards, of course, is that's going to have to come to an end, uh, probably in October, unless it's extended. Um, and, and demand, at least on the, the EIA's figures, uh, looks pretty weak for, for gasoline this summer compared with last year. Uh, and I think there are expectations of, of uh, tougher times ahead. Well, Julian, to that point, it, how perilous is it that you have inventories at such low levels from the Strategic Petroleum, Petroleum Reserve at a time when we're heading into a winter of great ambiguity, both with respect to the European picture as well as what happens with zero COVID in China if that comes off and no. you start to get more demand? Um, you know, I, I think we have to bear in mind what the strategic reserve was created for and what the situation was like uh, when it was created and, and through much of its history. This was created at a time when uh, the U.S. was very heavily dependent on imported oil, much more so perhaps than it is now. It was created to deal with uh, a disruption of supplies from the Middle East. Well, you know, any disruption of supplies will affect global prices. Um, it will actually affect the availability of oil in the U.S. much less now um, than it would have done in the 1970s or, or almost any time uh, since then. I mean, mm -hmm. you just look at what's happening now, the difference between uh, the, the sort of shortages that we're experiencing in parts of Europe where uh, some refiners and distributors are limiting uh, the supplies that they're making available and what's happening in the United States where you know, oil is abundant, uh, exports are at or very close to, to record highs. The strategic reserve, from that perspective of guaranteeing the physical availability of oil, yeah. doesn't need to be anywhere near as big as it was. Well, Julian, that's all on the supply side. On the demand side, have we seen any real destruction? It's always very difficult to say um, in sort of you know, the, the very near past. I mean, if you look at demand estimates uh, and even demand history, it's frequently revised, not just weeks or months into the past, but very often years into the past as more data become available. What we are seeing is that some measures of U.S. gasoline demand, for example, mm -hmm. suggest uh, that that has been coming down over the driving season rather than going up. It's uh, certainly significantly lower than it was last year, at least according to the EIA's weekly right. figures. We're having downgrades to oil demand forecasts. Um, you know, I, I wrote about this in, in our newsletter, uh, commodities newsletter yesterday. Uh, we've got the new forecasts coming from the International Energy Agency and OPEC tomorrow. I expect that both of those uh, will revise down right. their demand forecasts yeah. for this year and next. Julian, we've got to leave it there. Julian Lee, thank you so much for the brief here on oil and, of course, here with Brent. Uh, higher yesterday, we got up to $98 a barrel. Right now, Brent crude, 94 71 Lisa, I almost teared up there with Kaylee with the microeconomic demand elasticity question <laughs> to Julian Lee. I can Lee. understand, yes. You know, I, I mean, you know, it's, it's, a, it's just it's, it's like poetry. Yeah. You know.
I, like, I'm, I, I had a I good love, tutor, Tom. I honestly like, love what makes you emotional, Tom. It's, it's something it's like, that really you know. is very relatable. I think, though, it is a good question, right? Which is, okay. where is the demand? Can, do we have any evidence that demand is increased? Yeah, great. You're it's like, eh, okay. take yeah, it or leave it. You know, <laughs> this is on, folks, demand elasticity, which is a massive mystery out there. I learned this just as one example from Adam Siminski and Paul Sankey years ago. Game, gaming out the responsiveness of an economy to the price of oil is just brutal. It's very tough at lifting. Right now, equities advance up nine, up 12 on S&P futures. 34 minutes from this inflation report. Stay with us. I don't think we're going back to a period of time where you wake up each morning and worry about deflation. I think it's quite the opposite for the next few years. There's been a significant moderation in prices over the past month. Consumers have an enormous ability to take on higher prices. We're still seeing positive news that perhaps equities can still go higher in a tightening environment. We are absolutely seeing a very disrupted economy begin to heal. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Countdown to a pivotal CPI report. Good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. Tom Keen, John Farrow, Lisa Abramowitz, John out, Kaylee Lines very much in. We are about 30 minutes away from an all important uh, price inflation index. And how much, Tom, do we get a reaction that is bifurcated with a heavier weight to the upside surprise than the downside surprise? I don't have a clue on that important question, Lisa. I mean, we're going to parse headline and CPI. Mike McKee will be with us in 15 minutes to go into everything he's read in on. To me, the most interesting point, Lisa, is David Stubbs of J.P. Morgan in the last hour takes services, take out energy, and take out this new shelter inflation we've got and where do services stand? Yeah, and that's what you've been talking about as well. How much is that going to be the source, which is what people were expecting, the pivot away from goods to services. How much has that been curtailed yeah. by the lack of confidence? That said, how much does this really move the needle, right? I mean, people are talking about a sudden about face for what the Fed projection is going to be. There's a lot of time between now and September. There's Jackson Hole. There's a whole host of other data that can yeah. confirm or rebut what we might get. I'm going to go back to the immediate, the granularity here that we see, and we have to remember that so many of these serious Lisa, still show what our listeners and viewers feel, which is higher and higher inflation. Let's be clear. It hasn't turned around. And that's why we're looking at real wages and the fact that they're going more and more negative. Kaylee, as we look toward this report, what are you most focused on to give us a compass for where to go next, how to frame the data and how to frame a Fed response? I think it's going to be about the core metric, Lisa, which of course is what everyone's watching, but just how sticky this inflation is. Because on the one hand, yes, it would be significant if we do see price growth moderating, if it's not rising as fast. But prices are still going to climb, and ultimately the Fed would still like to get down to 2%. So it's not just about a single data point. It's about how quickly they can get down toward their target and what rate ultimately it's going to take for them to get there. So, Tom, is it fair to call the CPI Wednesday? Oh, yeah, it's absolutely CPI. No, uh, no yeah, question yeah. about And then PPI that. Thursday? And then yeah. University of Michigan Friday. We're going to yeah. track that out. It's going to be really it's, fun. This is a big deal. I mean, what we're going to see in 27 minutes is a big deal today. I would agree. And we're going to hear from Fed officials as well. Right now, the markets, you know, they are up. But I got to say, the lack of conviction is really yeah. noteworthy yeah. to me. I mean, to yeah. me, that's the takeaway. NASDAQ futures up 50 basis at 50, uh, up four tenths of a percent. You've got S&P up three tenths of a percent. Really, a churn there as you see yields come off a little bit on their highs. But that yield curve inversion, Tom, which you've been talking so much about, very very much front and center, send, uh, center, sending a pretty severe message. Oh, in the last day, right down near 50 basis points. This is the, a two-year yield higher than the 10-year yield by half a percentage point. We're very close to that right now. But what is amazing, Lisa, is the houses suggesting we could see greater and more rapid curve inversion. That's something new this week. Yeah, and Bank of America charting that out as well. Brian Nick has been charting that out as well as how you get to a disinflationary environment that's more comfortable, right? What rate do we get down to and how does the Fed influence that one way or another? Brian Nick, chief investment strategist at Nuveen. Brian, what are you looking for today and where is the balance of risks to an upside or downside surprise in markets? I think the balance of risk when you when you account for the severity of the response is still to the upside. So I think that if we get a hotter than expected core number, if it looks like rent inflation is not only staying high but accelerating, 
that's going to mean that the Fed is even more reluctant to take its foot off the brake. We already got that that hot employment report last week. This is just going to add to the evidence that the Fed's not going to be able to pivot to slower pace of rate hikes or even rate cuts by the middle of next year. I think we also want to see confirmation that the headline number is soft as expected. But I think the market's sort of looking through that. I think while the <clears throat> market did see the Fed getting more hawkish as oil sort of took the baton and ran with it and led inflation on the way up, I don't think the market's falling for the, the sense that as long as oil prices are in decline, the Fed's going to get more dovish. I don't think there's a symmetry there, and I think people have, have caught on to that. Do you think, Brian, that the market has reacted appropriately to 275 back-to-back -back rate hikes and the prospect of a 75 basis point rate hike at the next meeting, followed by 50 basis points, followed by a lot of a balance sheet unwind? Have markets come to this realization or are people looking over the potential lag effects of those kinds of moves? I would say if somebody works in asset management, the answer is yes. But if I was at the Fed, I would probably say no, because the the financial conditions indexes that we we're tracking have, have actually gotten easier since the Fed started hiking by 75 basis points and seems likely to do so mm -hmm. again in September unless there's a major change in the data. So this is not what I would want to see if I was at the Federal Reserve. Right. I think rhetorically we can expect them to, if not become more hawkish, at least sort of keep the message out there that they're worried about containing inflation. And I think, you know, a 0.5, even a 0.6% core inflation number this morning is going to give them right. plenty of fuel to do that. Right, Nick, I want to go to the Professor Kaylee Lines. She's working with David Blanchflower up at your Dartmouth, and Kaylee <laughs> Lines is all over demand destruction. Does Nuveen see evidence of demand destruction, which is a prerequisite to lower inflation? In some areas, yes. So if you look at the last 12 months uh, ending in June, we had uh, gasoline prices up 50%, but gasoline consumption, nominal consumption, was only up 40 So there's some demand destruction in gasoline. It's not, not large compared to the size of the price move that we're seeing. But I think consumers, again, throughout this whole uh, process over the last two and a half years, this really strange economy we've been in, have been really good at adapting, rotating out of places where prices have been rising, rotating into places where prices have been falling. And so the overall inflation shock, I think, hasn't been as severe as the headline numbers would suggest because there is this substitutability effect. But if you're driving less out of necessity or you're, you know, you're having mm -hmm. to, to cut back on your discretionary spending out of necessity to pay for necessities, um, that that's a much different kind of feeling. And that's why I think you see these consumer sentiment readings as poor as they have been. Well, Brian, to that point as well, what we've heard from the chip makers just over the last several days talking about a slowdown in demand, they make chips for smartphones and PCs. It shows maybe a shifting of behavior away from expensive electronic devices in the face of inflation. So obviously the print today is going to have implications for the economy and for the Federal Reserve. What is the read through realistically to corporate earnings, especially looking forward, because the second quarter hasn't been that awful? No, it hasn't. I think revenues have really been the key in the first half of the year. So the biggest risk to corporate earnings is uh, no, not necessarily inflation in and of itself, but the, the effect it has on, on demand. So if revenues are growing at double digits, we're not going to be that concerned about corporate earnings. Seems like they've dealt pretty well with the higher energy increase costs and the higher wage costs. But if revenue dries up, then there's not going to be any place for uh, for, for these, these companies to, to turn. And I think that's, that's the key. You talked about real wages uh, a little bit earlier. That, that is the key. We need to get real wages back up before nominal wages collapse under the weight of a slowing economy. And that's the race that the Fed is fighting itself in. How much do you think the Fed is going to be successful, Brian? I mean, we're talking about threading an incredible, the needle they have to thread is just very difficult. We all talk about how narrow the runway is to a soft landing. Where do you put the odds on this actually working out for them? Not as high as they were three months ago because we've gotten this hot inflation data and we've gotten higher than expected rate increases. And I think um, the market notion that they're going to be pivoting and cutting by March or April of next year, I think, is probably you know too much to hope for at this point, unless we're in a, a you know a, a more severe recession, in which case they're going to be cutting uh, for 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 you know negative reasons. Um, I, I think narrow path is the way I would describe it uh, for sure. Uh, I don't think markets are currently pricing in a severe recession outcome. So we think there's some maybe in between that soft landing disinflation scenario and the and the severe recession. And that seems to be what we're at, right. with, you know, S&P floating, you know, 15 percent off its highs. Credit spreads wider, but not at recession levels. I think that's the right. middle ground of the markets are at least betting. Right. On. As we go to Michael McKee here in our next segment and all that he's read and studied on inflation dynamics, we need to revisit a pregnant issue, and that is we're at inflation that is 40 years on. 
how long till we get back to some form of normal? I mean, is it like when the Chicago Cubs win again? I mean, you know, how long is it back to not 2%, but just a nirvana of normal inflation? I would settle for just the Yankees winning again, maybe a shorter time frame there. But Could I think when, I, when, when we talk to clients and they ask about, you know, the, getting back to normal, I say the next six to 18 months, so end of 2023, I think it's still going to feel abnormal yeah, not this as is crazy key. as the last as the last uh you know two years have felt but i think 2024 is where we want to start seeing three handle okay. two handle on inflation and back to a gdp growth rate that feels you know not spectacular but not terrible brian nick thank you for framing that timeline brian nick is with Nuveen. we greatly appreciate uh his ability i mean i mean lisa nick survived you know economics at dartmouth with blanche flower and yeah all never that. hit rates that's you get basically like a purple heart blanche when you graduate flower. from blanche flower's lecture you get a purple heart of some type it's i wonder what danny would like, think of his uh comments he really was pretty uh yeah. pretty strong danny's had a pretty strong view on there being more slack in the labor market yeah. and how the fed is going to move too quickly uh, sort of going against the grain care politically as well as from the sentiment i had a the privilege of lecturing to a pack lecture hall, Lisa, with Professor Blanche Flower at Dartmouth. And I'll tell you, it's a little bit intimidating when Douglas Irwin, the giant on trade wars and trade, you know, international trade, is sitting in the front row. Yeah, well, you're, you're like, like the elasticity of Tang. No, I did, <laughs> really all these strong. people are way better at elasticity and partial differentials than I'll ever be. We spent a lot of time talking about economic history. And Lisa, seriously, that's the moment we're in here 19 minutes away. This is history that we're living right now. And what's the historical analog? Is it the 70s or no, is it 1940s, no, no. right? And, or is there don't none? Don't get me going. Is we there none? This. Is that what you're basically it's saying? It's not Bob Seeger. We're not, you know, I don't want to relive Bob Seeger from five or six. We got more response from Robert Seeger in the 70s than anything else we've done. Okay. You're going to start singing? No, I think people are saying it's the <clears> 40s more. No, Bob, Michael McKee's going to come out and sing as well. We're going to do a duet here on Hollywood Nights and, and oh, all that. Everyone's just on the edge. Futures advance up 17. Michael McKee next. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Ritika Gupta. A few minutes from now, we'll get what's been called the most scrutinized economic report in the world. It will tell us where the U.S. fight against inflation stands. According to a Bloomberg survey, the Consumer Price Index probably rose at an annualized rate of 8.7% in July. That is down from June's figure, but still way above the Fed's 2% target. The CPI is out at 8.30 a.m. New York time. And in New York, former President Trump says he will be questioned today under oath about his dealings as a real estate mogul. The investigation involves claims that the Trump organization misstated the value of its prized assets for tax reasons. That comes just two days after federal investigators searched the former president's home in Florida. Republicans echoed the assertion that the search was politically motivated. China has ended those unprecedented military exercises near Taiwan, but it says it plans to conduct regular patrols in the region. The Chinese began the drills last week after U.S. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi visited Taiwan. Meanwhile, the U.K.'s Foreign Office has summoned the Chinese ambassador to discuss what it calls Beijing's aggressive and wide-ranging escalation against Taiwan. Elon Musk has sold $6.9 billion of stock in Tesla, his biggest sale ever. The world's richest person says he wants to avoid a last-minute sell-off of the car maker's shares in case he's forced to go ahead with his deal to buy Twitter. Musk says he'll buy Tesla shares again if the deal doesn't close. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Richard Gupta. This is Bloomberg. are entirely too comfortable with this notion where it's just going to be a straight line down, smooth and easy, right to the uh, Fed 2%. I still think there's lots of room for volatility, lots of room uh, for rates to move both uh, higher and lower, uh, and uh, credit spreads to be much more volatile. Greg Peters of PGM with an important comment there yesterday on what's going to happen here. He was tilting towards price down, yield up. 
uh, in the fixed income space as well. We're going to get to it now, 11 minutes away from truly an historic report, and we're going to be briefed by the guy that knows his best. Michael McKee, yeah, he's Bloomberg Economics and Policy, policy Correspondent, but far the, more than that, besides the fact he's cut and chiseled, he and I have lived other inflation bouts. This is not the 70s, is it, Michael? No, inflation dynamics have changed a lot, and the, the, the first thing that comes to mind is the energy intensity in the economy. The mileage on cars has gotten much better. Uh, appliances have gotten much better. So we use less electricity. We use less gasoline. And so that has a mitigating effect on prices. If right. <laughs> it, It's hard for people who are at the gas pump to see. But when you look at inflation-adjusted prices, they're they're lower than you, they used you, to be. You go, through beneath, you go through the headline data better than anybody I've ever seen. If it's a partition of goods, disinflation, surging goods inflation, it has rolled over, or service sector inflation, quiescent trend line, it's moved up but not rolled over. Which matters to you in 10 minutes? Well, we're probably going to look at services inflation because services is the largest part of the economy. It's also what was missing during the pandemic. And now people have come back and they're starting to take advantage of services, travel, things like that. And the big impact on services is labor costs. And we saw the... Uh, the, the uh, unit labor costs number rise over 10 percent, almost 11 percent uh, yesterday for the second quarter. So how much are uh, services companies able to pass that along and need to pass that along? It's a little bit of a different calculation than trying to figure out what your input costs are at a steel mill. Um, so uh, that's a number to look at is uh, services price inflation. Mike, a lot of people have pointed out that before the previous 9.1% uh, CPI print, the White House brought out Janet Yellen, Treasury Secretary, to talk about why, yes, it's high, yes, it's a problem, but they're going to get it down and they're fighting it, and it is. Uh, there are elements that are a little less scary. This time we've heard nothing, and some people are taking signal from the lack of discussion from the White House trying to talk it down ahead of time, saying it's going to be a downside surprise. Is there any credence to this? I don't know. <laughs> this could be the Greenspan briefcase indicator. Uh, the White House is obviously has been trying to manage uh, the public's expectations for economic data, particularly the jobs numbers. And the, they knew they, we were going to have a bad CPI just because of energy prices last time. Now we know we'll have a better probably headline number because energy prices have come down. But that doesn't mean overall inflation is going to slow hugely. Uh, but that it might be getting into the area of it's a little hard to explain to the public, so uh, we'll stay away from it. If it's a good number, right. I would imagine you'll hear from the White House. I'm struggling also with real wages, and I've been talking about it all morning, but how do you message that you want workers to gain share, that labor should be a bigger share of the overall corporate profits at a time when people are worried about both runaway inflation, a wage spiral, but also a cost of living that is getting out of control for a lot of people? What is the correct message? Because you don't want to say, we want you to basically have an effectively lower paycheck. Yeah, that's a very tough message to send. And the Fed is stuck with uh, that dilemma in trying to say, we, we want to bring down demand so that wage increases moderate. But at the same time, Jay Powell says, we want people to continue to get higher paychecks. And so how do you delineate what is the proper amount? I mean, from an economic point of view, you can look at maybe a 3% to 3.5% increase in wages on a year-over-year -year basis is an acceptable level that uh, generally economists think won't produce a lot of inflation. But again, that becomes something that's really hard for the public to understand uh, in this dynamic. And I don't even mention how hard it is for the administration to talk about that. On, this, on the Federal Reserve and how they're going to read this data, Mike, obviously it's going to be important. That is why we have been talking about it for the last two and a half hours. And yet we're getting it here on August 10th, which is your birthday. Happy birthday, by the way. <laughs> Well before the September birthday. 21st meeting, we get another CPI print before that. So how much is this really going to influence whether the move is 75 basis points in September? 
That will depend on the makeup of it. Uh, the headline numbers won't matter as much, particularly the headline number, because it is so heavily influenced by energy and food, and there are signs that both of them are going to start to come down. But they'll look at the core, and they'll take that apart, and they'll want to see whether we're seeing broad-based price increases. Are those high unit labor costs being passed on through a lot of different industries? If that's the case, they might be leaning towards 75. But you're right, we have another indicator. Well, we've got two because we've got a PCE at the end of uh, August, and then we've got the CPI in September. And so if there's a trend, we may get another view of how that trend is playing out. And uh, particularly interesting is that the next CPI report in September is during the Fed blackout. Oh. So we'll get a response today from a couple of mm -hmm. Fed speakers to uh, what they see in the CPI today. But you won't have any guidance in September after that CPI comes out. On radio, you should see the TV chart of the two-year yield lifting up here. We see that right now with an ever so slight lift here into this inflation report to two digits, 3.28% in the two-year yield. Now, because it's your birthday, does that mean the Braves gift the Red Sox a win tonight? <laughs> I, think that's only, I think that's only fair. I mean, <laughs> they, 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 they had lost. You know, the tease the last night. They did not do Kaylee any favors on her birthday yesterday <laughs> by losing in the 11th inning, but yeah. uh, they came close. Oh, well, good. Happy birthday, Michael McKee. He'll continue with us here with important coverage of what we see on price change in America. Lisa, we've got to remember that this is not a bunch of mathematical mumbo jumbo. This is a huge part of America flat on their back. Especially the lower income tiers where it's eating up a bigger and bigger proportion of disposable income where you have people making the decision between filling up their gas uh, their gas tanks and mm. buying an extra uh, sweater or an extra pair of pants. And how much do we see that continue to pressure margins, which is some of the bear cases going forward, uh, versus alleviate well, in terms of people pushing back against price increases and getting inflation back down? Kaylee, one thing off the radar here as we go into this report report four minutes away is we've barely touched on health care and mm. yet I hear that percolating in different reports as a study for the end of the year. Well and I'm sure that will be a point that the administration is trying to make Tom because when we look at that Inflation Reduction Act we know that some health care pricing drug pricing yeah. is included in that. <clears throat> Not so sure economists agree that it's going to have a real, at least near-term, impact on the inflation the American people are facing, however. We welcome all of you to this historic report on the nation's inflation with Futures Up 13. Stay with us with Michael McKee. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg Surveillance, we welcome all of you. John Farrow out today. Kaylee lines in with Lisa Bramitz and Tom Keen here. Moments away from an inflation report, waiting for the numbers across the acclaimed ECO screen of the Bloomberg terminal. And Michael McKee will give us a view to maybe what will be a constructive report. It's a constructive report, Tom. It comes in better than expected with CPI on a month-over-month -month basis flat, no change at all. That is down from 1.3% uh, in the month of June, so a major drop in the headline number. The core goes uh, up by three-tenths of a percent. The forecast was for five-tenths, and in June it was seven-tenths. So that's an unexpectedly better-than-forecast uh, report. On a year-over-year -year basis, CPI is at 8.5 percent. We'd expected a drop to 8.7 from the 9.1 last month. And the core is at 5.9 percent. Now, the expectation was it would go higher. 5.9 was the same number as in June. The expectation was it would go higher to 6.1 percent because pressures were spreading. But this is the kind of news that's going to make uh, the folks at the well, Bureau of Labor Statistics and at the White House and at the Fed uh, smile a little bit. Mike, look into the data further here. We'll come right back to yeah. you with a big lift to the market. Futures up 1.38 percent, 57 S&P points. Dow out over 33,000 is remarkable, 356 points, and a solid 2 percent move in the NASDAQ 100. Lisa, describe the 210 spread with a launch to a lesser inversion. Yeah, I think that that is the takeaway here. You see the two-year yield plunge on the heels of a, the right kind of downside surprise. Right. You've got a tick back to 43. 
a negative 43 uh, yield curve inversion on the basis points. Honestly, though, how much does this really move the needle when you're still talking about core CPI at 5.9 percent? And well, that, I think, is going to be the key message from a lot of Fed officials. Yeah, a step at a time here. Dollar comes in weaker with finally a 103 print on euro is, well, Michael, the level of surprise here on a fan distribution of all the experts you reviewed, where are we on that fan distribution? This has got to be right at the edge of great news? Uh, yeah, as long as you define great news as something that doesn't move that much, because as uh, one of your guests was saying just before we went on the air, this isn't oh, yeah, going to be on, a, the president's a, a big come straight out. The president's going to come out and say, we've launched from 9.1% down to 8.5%. Can the president extrapolate out and say, we're going to be at 8.2% or 8.3% in 30 days? My, my guess looking at this is that maybe he can. Uh, looking at some of the underlying numbers. Now, we don't know what will happen with energy prices. The war goes on in Ukraine. Uh, but at this point, gasoline was down 7.7% in the month. In June, it rose 11.2%. So do we get the same kind of percentage drop? That's hard to say. Food prices went up. Food at home, 1.3% higher. It was 1% in June. Now, we've seen agricultural commodities fall. Yeah. So maybe that will work its way into prices. We get PPI tomorrow. We'll take a look at that. Uh, but the, also, food prices depend a lot on the weather. So you can't say for sure these things are going to happen. But um, we finally see a drop in used car prices. Been waiting for that for a long time, down four-tenths of a percent. They rose 1.6 percent last month. Uh, new car prices up six-tenths. That's a tenth lower. And apparel prices, this is one to watch, uh, down yeah, one-tenth right. after rising eight <clears throat> tenths the month before. Remember, uh, we all the earnings reports that we've had on retailers, they're all talking about large inventories that they're going to have to mark down to get rid of so, because people, uh, they didn't get them into yeah. the stores in time <clears throat> for the right seasons. So there are discount stores that are going to be right. uh, putting those things on sale. Futures up evermore. NASDAQ futures is the roulette wheel, uh, the, uh, the, the betting wheel here of the markets up 2.6%. Lisa, I just extrapolated out out a one, two, three, four point core CPI trend. This is bogus mathematics, Lisa, but it gets you back to a 2% core CPI in the vicinity of the end of 2024. Bogus mathematics, what everybody needs on a Wednesday morning. What I'm looking at, though, Tom, you are so right to be looking at the NASDAQ and the S&P surging, and it gets the Fed further away from their goal, right? I mean, how <clears throat> right. much is this not what the Fed wants to be seeing at a time where they want financial conditions to Yeah, I to like tighten, that idea. And they want to yeah. get it down quickly. Mike, <clears throat> How much are Fed officials going to push back against the sort of belief in a re sort of doubling down on the Fed pivot on the heels of this data? Uh, they'll push back on it because this is uh, one report. And as we said, there are several more before the next time they have to make a decision. <clears throat> and you look at some of the other categories in this, it's still got some worrisome news. We're looking at rent of shelter up half a percent after uh, six tenths last month <clears throat> and re uh, rent of primary residence up seven tenths. Uh, the owner's equivalent rent, which is the measure that they look at to see what house prices are doing, up six tenths after seven tenths last month. So it's still in the uh, shelter category, in the rent category, still going up at a fairly strong pace. And that is going to well, be a problem going forward because it takes a long time to get that through the system. Our advantage is Michael McKee will dive into the pages and pages of data that we see in this inflation report for America. To summarize again, a constructive inflation report. Brian Deese with Lisa Bramowitz in the nine o'clock hour on radio and television with a White House view oh. on that good news. Futures up 67 in the NASDAQ again up 2.4 percent here's the, here's the worst news for you tom please uh you probably already knew this distilled spirits at home up seven tenths yes we in the last that. month Thank after you. after one Thank tenth you. in june so a big, I, big rise there i heard about that from michael pond before you brought it up yeah. at a global uh, inflation linked research at barclays pond always diving into the inflation data michael you and i go back to when nobody wanted to talk to you because inflation was boring Inflation is now less than boring. When do we get back to boring inflation? Well, first of all, Tom, this was a good report. 
let's see, we, we could stop there, but we're, we're not going to. You know, this is a necessary print for the Fed, uh, but, but it's not sufficient. We need to see a lot more. You can think about this print as, as sort of like the weather. You know, it's better today than it has been over, over the past few days, but it's still summer. There's still a lot of humidity out there. It's, it's not great. Um, so, you know, yeah. it's, it's in the right direction. Uh, but we're certainly not, not there yet. What will be the bond response to this? Michael, you are expert at the analysis across full faith and credit. What is your government bond theme off a better inflation report for America? Well, again, what does it mean for the Fed? And we, what we think it means for the Fed is it makes it more likely that our call will be right for the September uh, FOMC hike of, of 50 basis points. If we had gotten another strong reading, even on consensus reading uh, going into it, that increased the chance of 75. So for now, we feel pretty comfortable about our 50 basis point call. That's less than what was priced in. Uh, so it's not surprising that we're seeing a bit of a, a rally here with a bit of a, a steepening in the curve. Michael, how about that bogus back? mathematics that Tom Keene was doing, <laughs> trying to extrapolate out the pace of declines. Can we do that? Is there any linear extrapolation that you're looking at to determine how quickly we go back to a rate that's much more palatable to both consumers as well as officials? Sure. So as, as Mike was saying, the, the details matter. And one of the key details of today's report was that the shelter component, which makes up 40 percent of core, uh, is still rising at a strong rate. Importantly, that tends to trend. So if the, the downside surprise was because of a couple outliers that aren't expected to continue, then that's going to get not give the Fed any complacency here. Uh, they're going to continue to weigh on the, the, the factors within CPI that trend. So the fact that shelter component continues to be strong, you can't just linearly extrapolate uh, today's print into even the August print, which we expect, still expect to be relatively strong. How concerning is it to you, Michael, that the knee-jerk reaction is what we're seeing in equity markets right now, a strong rally, just over, like in one minute, just bam, there you go. People are going full risk on. How much would you fade that versus lean into that on the expectation that, yes, we are seeing a deceleration, and yes, we have been past peak inflation? Well, first of all, it's not surprising. You know, these days, when, when data comes out, the market's reaction, particularly risk on uh, assets, tend to be um, good news is bad news. We saw that in the employment report uh, on Friday when uh, we got a really good report. And what that did is raise expectations of more Fed hikes, which isn't good for risk on assets. So we, we have a, a report today that leads to a little bit more less hawkish Fed. I won't say dovish. Uh, and, and therefore, it's good for risk assets today. Michael McKee with us as well. Michael Ponda Barclays with us. If you're just joining us on radio and television, it's terrific inflation report, a joy for the White House, no question about that. And markets celebrate up 68 S&P points, 1.7 percent. Nasdaq up 2.3 percent, even up more a bit ago. Michael McKee has had a few minutes here to dive further into the report. You were making a joke about uh, spirits at home. <laughs> uh, that, that's, that's the degree of granularity you can go to. What's another granular item that sticks out? Well, one thing I was interested in was what happened with medical care, because we've just had this we new legislation this, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. that would be passed. Prescription yeah. drugs were up three-tenths of a percent after a one-tenth gain. Uh, that's a fairly high move for prescription drugs. So that's something that could be affected if the administration is able to get something in place uh, to negotiate for Medicare, uh, and if the companies don't raise the price on people who don't get Medicare. Uh, Non-prescription drugs up 1.3 percent. So if you're taking Tylenol because you had too much of the distilled spirits, Tom, you're, mm -hmm. you're paying more for that. Uh, the uh, recreation uh, component uh, up two tenths. Uh, commodities with uh, declining prices, as we've seen for some time for televisions, video equipment, right. etc. So uh, some of the inflation dynamics that we are used to are coming into play here. If you're just joining us on radio and on television to the Bloomberg world, Michael McKee is with us and Michael Pond as well of Barclays and, of course, Bloomberg after an historic inflation report. Calendar item, Brian Deese in conversation with our Lisa Abramowitz uh, here within uh, the hour. We've seen markets, of course, surge and continue to surge. S&P 500, a 1.7% move. And critically, the VIX comes in a whole stick. We've walked away from 22 to a more constructive market of 20.69. Kaylee?
Well, Tom, I'm looking at break-even rates as well, not just nominal yields. On the two-year, we're down 11 basis points on the day, 2.78%. So, Michael Pond, does that seem correct to you that two years out from now, we're realistically going to have inflation that much closer to the Fed's target? Uh, we, we think so. The market is priced for a decent amount of disinflation, and our forecasts actually have even more disinflation, so lower inflation than what the market is priced in. The market's priced for almost 3% inflation, not just next year, uh, but two years from now. The one-year rate implied by uh, break-evens is, is almost at 3%. So the market's not believing that the Fed has yet done enough <clears throat> to bring inflation down anytime soon. Now, if we look further out, say five-year, five-year implied by the market, that is priced uh, more consistent with the Fed's target of 2%. Uh, so the market thinks that over time the Fed will get it right, but it'll take several right, years, right. not just a couple quarters. Michael Pond, stay with us, please, with Barclays. And Michael McKee with us now joining us. We're only doing Michaels today on the Inflation Show. Kaylee <laughs> demanded that. Michael Gapin joins us now, head of U.S. economics at Bank of America Global Research. And this is an incredibly important add-on to our coverage in that B of A has a really cautious call on the equity markets and on the bond space as well. Michael, you have my best chart I've seen in three days, which is the duration of painful inflation for Americas. Does it really sustain out in the next year and even into 2024? I mean, we think it we think it does in the sense that it'll take a few years for inflation to get back down to the to the Fed's target and, and restoring price stability. We we think there'll be stickiness primarily in the area of some of these services prices that yes, airlines gave us a bit of a, a relief today, but there will likely be some ongoing stickiness on the services side. Obviously, the very good news in this report is what we saw with used cars. We've all been waiting for some of these durables prices to come down. That would be the next shoe to drop uh, after gasoline prices come down. So a lot of good news right. in this report, no, no questions at all. But I think we're looking for some stickiness in services to persist. Michael, let me steal the thunder then from Katie Line. She was discussing demand destruction. Do we see demand destruction in this report away from used cars? Not in not in this one particular report. No, we see some relief here, right? So it's, paradoxically, the weaker the rest of the world gets, sometimes it helps out the U.S. And in this case, the decline in energy prices and how quickly that feeds through to, to gasoline prices. And again, if we if this is the first of successive reports where we could see some reversals in durables prices, that's going to help out the U.S. consumer. Well, obviously, Michael, the Fed's goal is to get demand down. They also would like to see financial conditions getting more restrictive. And yet what we see with a more than 2% rally on the NASDAQ 100 futures right now is financial conditions actually getting easier. Is a good news report on the inflation front still a bad news report for the Federal Reserve if that is the outcome? No, I think the, the way that I would look at it is obviously the labor market is, is extremely strong and demand conditions are strong. And uh, as your previous guest, Michael Pond, mentioned, good news there is bad news in terms of what it means for the Fed. The Fed's soft landing outlook is greatly improved if core goods start rolling over, for example. So the softer inflation well, prints are, the more the Fed can accept good news on the other side of the data front. So, you know, they need these types of reports in order to you know, improve the likelihood of soft landing. What's a calendar item on that, Michael McKee? I believe we're in August 10-ish. Uh, we're going to get to September 10-ish. There's going to be another report, right? Uh, I believe it's September 13th. I okay, can but, double but, check that well, very that's quickly. Fine, but, but the point is, if we get two months like this, how does that change the dialogue for Chairman Powell? Does he take a victory lap? Uh, no, he doesn't take a victory lap. He makes sure that everybody knows that the Fed is still focused on this because it's going to take just just mathematically. And you know, Michael Gapin can probably give you a better uh, off the top of his head hint than than me. It's going to take a long time to get down to where the Fed will feel comfortable in moving rates. They've said they're going to get to neutral or, or right. above neutral and stay there even as inflation declines. So they're going to have to get right. down to three percent or or so is the is what they're hinting before they do any kind of move. How long does that take? We see an advanced Dow futures now up 433,152 on the Dow. SPX up 71 points and a 2.4% move on NASDAQ 100. Really something. Kaylee? 
Let's bring Michael Pond back into the conversation as well. Obviously, we've now had a few minutes to digest this report, yet the moves are sticking in the bond market. Can they stick past today? Well, what we think was clear in this re report, and it's been our view, that the inflation outlook is now much more balanced than it had been. A few months ago, everything was pointing in the same direction of risk to inflation being to the upside. Whether we look at commodities, shipping costs, the dollar, uh, wage growth, et cetera, they're all in the same exact direction. And now it's a much more balanced outlook. Wages, as Mike Gapin just said, uh, you know, the labor market is very tight, and that's coming through in, in the wage report that we got on Friday and um, average hourly earnings uh, as well. So, you know, but on the flip side, commodities have rolled over. You look at copper, palm oil, corn, uh, coffee, cotton, pick any commodity and you, it's likely been, uh, you know, off its peak. Shipping costs on a year-over-year -year basis are down 30%. Uh, mm -hmm. So ener energy's down. So you can go down the list. And it's a much more balanced outlook, and that's some of what we, we got today. But you really need consistency in these reports. Yeah. One report is not all it's going to take. Well, and of course, one report is not all we're getting this week. Michael Gapin, PPI is tomorrow. What's the read-through? I think the read-through there is, you know, X energy prices. We're still likely to see, uh, you know, solid underlying price pressures in, in the domestic economy. Uh, so 0.4s, 0.5s, which is kind of where the market is is thinking. Uh, later in the in the week, I, I you know I think w will be really interesting to see if import prices, ex petroleum, decline again for the second straight month. That's where our head is around. That's where consensus is. Again, that's a Mike Pond point. We need to see these types of things coming through. We need to see them on more than one report. Getting a, a strong dollar to give us some pass through into import prices in the context of, of lower trade costs would, would be very important. But I, I think we suspect a blend here, uh, strong import or strong underlying price pressures, producer prices, but we could get some more relief on import prices. Michael, what's the number? Michael, I got five Michaels with me today. Nathanson's on deck. It's killer. Kaylee, who did this? I mean, I've never had so many Michaels around me in my life. Michael Gapin of Bank of America what is the single attribute that drives inflation lower from a 9% level? I don't think that there's one. I, this is the point. I, you don't get bad outcomes on inflation like this without a multitude of things happening. So I think we need relief on, on energy and commodity prices. We're getting that. We need <clears throat> payback on core goods prices. Some signs we're getting right. that. And then we need moderation in the domestic economy. I don't think it's one thing. I think we need to have advances on multiple fronts. Tom, if I could add just one more to that, inflation expectations. So the, the Fed in, in June was particularly concerned about a sharp jump in uh, the infl uh, inflation component, inflation expectation component of the Michigan right. survey. That's back down now, as is the inflation expectations components of the New York Fed survey and break-evens right. as well off their highs. So that's an important factor it, for the Fed in their outlook for inflation. Uh, right now, Michael Gapin has to leave us at Bank of America. Thank you so much, Michael Gapin, for dropping by today on this historic uh, moment. Michael McKee with us with Bloomberg Economics. And, of course, uh, Michael Pond of Barclays continues with his true expertise in the fixed income uh, space. Kaylee, why don't you bring in Cameron Kreis, who's synthesizing this. I want to do a major shout-out, though, first to Michael Nathanson, who we, we were going to have Craig Moffat on, but it's an all-Michael show until Kreis yeah. showed up. So we had Nathanson on to talk about the media, and we will do that again soon with a giant from Moffat Nathanson. Kaylee? Yeah, record number of Michaels. I'm about to start calling you Michael Tom Keen, but let's get to Cameron Kreis, who has a different name, thank the Lord, who is also parsing this data. Cameron, just looking at the moves we are seeing on the back of this, yields dramatically lower, futures dramatically higher, the dollar dramatically weaker. Is this just a knee-jerk reaction, or is this one that's going to stick off the back of this print? Well, I mean, ultimately, we're just sort of <laughs> unwinding a lot of what we priced uh, after the payroll figure, right? Um, you know, essentially, that pushed us to 75 for September, and now we've, we've gone back to, to 50. So I suspect we'll, we'll continue to price 50 for September. Um, and, yeah, I, I, would, I would think that uh, certainly on the yield, yield front, um, these moves will probably... Uh, will probably stick by and large. 
Um, as for, you know, for equities, uh, you know, that kind of remains sort of subject to the ebb and flow, not only of inflation and monetary policy, but also uh, clearly there's a sensitivity to growth numbers as well. So if we see henceforth that some of the growth figures are looking quite poor, then, then one might posit that equities could, could in turn look a little more vulnerable. And of course, we see, could see a fresh catalyst for markets across asset classes later on today when we get reaction to these numbers from Federal Reserve officials. Michael McKee, we're just about two hours away from Charlie Evans talking about the economy. Then a little later on, Neil Kashkari will be discussing inflation in particular. What do you expect their messaging to be after a print like this one? Well, you know, they come from different places a little bit. Uh, Charlie Evans a little more dovish than Neil Kashkari. Kari, but I think they're both going to deliver the same bottom line message that this is good news, but we are going to wait until mm -hmm. we get much closer to the decision to make a decision about what we're going to do in September. Because as Cameron was saying, things uh, can go back and forth. Greg Peters was talking earlier about how right. uh, volatility is the name of the game. And that's what we're going to be seeing with all of these numbers for the next month, because nobody really knows right. where we're going with this. Michael Palm, what's your lead concept as you write for Barclays this morning. Well, you know, the takeaway from you know from the Fed perspective, you got to think of the Fed as a risk manager. Um, and you know, a year from now, if they didn't do enough and inflation's still high, they will have been seen as making a big mistake. If they do too much and inflation comes in too low and the economy is a little bit softer, uh, they'll they'll call that a win. Um, and so, you know, from a risk management perspective, this mm -hmm. print doesn't change the outlook. Uh, they still need to, to continue to focus on bringing inflation down, even though this is good news. Michael Pond, I'm going to let you go because I know you've got duties at Barclays as well. We're going to continue here with Michael McKee and Cameron Kreis of Bloomberg. But, Michael Pond, thank you so much for joining us today. Cameron, just on a hunch, I did a quick Fibonacci retrace of the Dow Jones Industrial Average. It was just a hunch. And we are exactly at a 50 percent retracement from the top to the bottom and making it back up to the top again of Dow 36,000. When do you know that a bear market rallies the beginning of a bull market? Uh, in hindsight <laughs> is, the, uh, is the only real answer. Uh, the only real answer there. I mean, I think it, it, it's easy to forget. I mean, if we go back and look at historical analogs um, in 2000, uh, the peak of the dot-com <clears throat> bubble, uh, the market peaked in March, but almost reached a new high in September if you look at the S&P 500. Even the, even the NASDAQ 100 came within like 13% of its, of its, of its uh, bubble peak in September of 2000. So a, a retest uh, or a substantial <clears throat> rally after an initial drawdown uh, is completely consistent with a lot of the historical price action. Unfortunately, you only know if you're in a new bull market kind of once you, once you make a new high, and that obviously only comes with, 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 with the benefit of hindsight. Well, Cameron, will the Federal Reserve be happy to see new highs in the equity market when they want tighter financial conditions? At what point, what level, would they step in and be like, guys, no? Uh, yeah, I mean, that's the, that's the, that's the question. I would think... Um, echoing the sort of the previous speaker, um, that yeah, the the, the 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 battle hasn't been won yet um, in in terms of inflation. This is a an encouraging first step on the path, uh, but it is not the end of the journey. Right. It's the it's the beginning of the uh, of the journey. So to see financial conditions loosen markedly, thus boosting right. uh, the nominal demand again, is sort of counterproductive. So. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think there right. is – this isn't the end of the, of the tightening cycle. And let's not forget, it. we've still got another payroll number and another CPI figure before they render their decision in, right. uh, in September. So everything can still change. Cameron Christ, thank you so much for joining us this morning, head of macro policy here at Macro Research, I should say, here at Bloomberg. Dropping in briefly, too briefly, Kathy Jones joins us, chief fixed income strategist at Charles Schwab. Kathy, good news do I buy bonds, bills, and notes? <laughs> well, I think this uh, this is, as uh, all your previous speakers have been saying, is it's a first step. It's certainly not conclusive that we've got, you know, peak inflation behind us. But, uh, yes, I you know, all along we have thought that as long as the Fed is determined to get inflation down, 
then um, the you know yield curve will invert. They will tighten until that happens, and ultimately, that is good news for the bond market. On that curve inversion, obviously, it is less so now after the report, mm -hmm. Kathy, negative 42 basis points. Have we already seen the depths if this is the trend? You know, if we get some more good prints like this uh, and some uh, easing up in the labor market data, I would say that maybe that was it. You know, historically, it's been hard to go below 40 or 50 basis points on two tens. So uh, we, we did it in the early 80s, but we haven't really done it since. So my my guess is that that could be the low if we are in a in a place where, you know, uh, where we start to see these trend in the right direction. Kathy, to move it to Fed policy, Michael McKee has had to leave here as he gets ready for his continuing coverage for the morning of this huge news. And I do want to emphasize, folks, we've still got a bid to the market. We're not down to a 19 VIX, but we're getting there rapidly, 20.58 on the VIX. Kathy, is today a sea change for the analysis of this Fed? Is today a profound day or another day along the path? Well, I guess we'll only know that, you know, a couple of hmm. months from here. Uh, but I, I think it could be, it's a huge sigh of relief for the Fed. It yes. gives them some breathing room. And it could be, it could mark a turning point. We just need to see more confirmation of that, where where we start to see the numbers ebb a bit yeah. consistently, and then uh, then the Fed can say, yeah, that this was the, the turning point. But, Kathy, a turning point in the pace of rate hikes or a turning point in terms of the ultimate destination? Oh, uh, the pace uh, more than the destination. Now, the destination's been up for grabs anyway. Um, I think there's been a wide disagreement uh, among economists, uh, among the Fed members, and in the market as to where the ultimate destination is. And we still don't know, but um, the pace could ease up a bit, which would be good news. Kathy Jones, thank you so much. Greatly appreciated. Two short notice here, and we'll have much more with her in the coming days. She is at Charles Schwab as well. Kaylee, Neil Dutta published this moments ago. We are thrilled that he could join us yesterday from Renaissance Macro. And he gets to the story of now. Wage growth is running red hot. And absent a turnaround in productivity, this will ultimately fuel higher prices. There in a single sentence, Kaylee, is the fold-in of this efficiency of our economy, our productivity, which wage growth mm. and the idea of how it affects price. And the answer is this is tangible. Yeah, and it's going to be something to watch in the reports going <clears throat> forward, Tom, because ultimately what we've just heard from all of our guests is, yes, this is good news, but it is only one day of data. We have another CPI report coming in September prior to the Fed's next policy decision. So is this the beginnings of the makings of a trend, or is this just a standout report? Well, Obviously. Yeah, Tom. yeah, I'm going to be more optimistic about it after a bang up jobs report and after this yeah. hugely constructive CPI report. There is a sequence here, but as Neil Dutta says, what about the nation's productivity? Please stay with us. Brian Deese in the next hour.